Okay, we're going to call the uh, public safety meeting to order. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Alderman Boyd. Present. Alderman Davis. Present. Alderman Howard. Present. Alderman Spencer. Alderman Boyd. Present. Alderman Bosley. Present. Alderman Muhammad. Here. Alderman Oldenburg. Present. Alderman Narayan. Here. Alderman Clark Hubbard. Here. Alderman Page. Present. Chairman Vicoro. Present. 11 present. You have quorum. Thank you. Uh, we're going to need to uh, start with the approval of the minutes from the September 14th meeting. Uh, if everybody's looked them over, we'll take a motion. So moved. Okay. And second. Second. Okay, we got seconds all over the place here now. Um, Madam Clerk, would you please call the uh, roll? Alderman Boyd. Aye. Alderman Davis. Aye. Alderman Howard. Aye. Alderman Spencer. Alderman Boyd. Aye. Alderman Bosley. Aye. Alderman, thank you. Alderman Muhammad. Aye. Alderman Oldenburg. Certainly Aye. Alderman Narayan. Aye. Alderman Clark Hubbard. Aye. Alderman Page. Aye. Chairman Vicoro. Aye. Eleven aye votes. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna start off with the firefighters this morning. The uh, the nine one one bill and firefighters. Um, and I, I want to express a few things before we even kick this thing off. Then, first off, to get a letter from the director of public safety today, an hour before the meeting is typical nonsense. To say what great work they're doing and all these groups they met with, but have left out the board of aldermen. He had no consideration for this committee. Basically it said this committee means nothing to them. I asked for the chief. He said he couldn't make it. Uh, I don't know exactly why, but then I, my understanding, then I wanted the assistant chief, someone that could explain why combining these systems would make sense. Instead, what they did is typical. They always want to control the scenario. So what they did is they would not let anybody show up. So we will start to exercise our right to subpoena people. This committee has the right to understand why it's a good idea or a bad idea to put the 911 system, police and fire together. I know from the city charter that you cannot do this without going back to a vote of the people, but they don't want to hear that either. They yet, you know, I'm really upset about this, more so than maybe I should be, but this could be a great idea. It could be the worst idea, but just so you know, nobody on this committee counts. They're meeting without us. They do things without us. And to ban the people from coming into this meeting or tell the people that they're not coming into this meeting to tell us why they think this is a good or a bad idea is completely typical. And what will happen is the same typical thing. We tried to tell them on the workhouse, this group said, we're for closing the workhouse, but we feel it should be done uh, the, the way it's being done now. They completely screwed up the system. Now they're trying to rebuild the system. They say, gee, we want to take the money away from the police. And they did. And thank God, as a group of aldermen, we put some money back. Now they're taking police from other areas and moving them away from our neighborhoods to downtown. And I assume paying overtime. You know, so I'm, like I said, 
had they been courteous, which they're not, and had they, you know, let people with uh, some experience and knowledge on how the systems work come in and talk to us, we might have been able to have an intelligent decision. Instead, I can tell you, I am opposed to putting these two systems together. And maybe I wouldn't have been had someone with some intelligence and knowledge on this had come to speak in front of us. Having said that, I, 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 will, I will quit rambling, but what I, I, we do have one guest speaker that they somehow couldn't block, and hopefully they don't take it out on him somehow. Uh, and that would be uh, Demetrius, I, I call him Al, Alfred from the Firefighters Union. I'm gonna let him speak and then we're gonna go down the list. Um, I do have uh, Alderman Bill Stevenson's not on the committee. I did tell him that he will be able to speak right after Al. He just wants to express some concerns and then he's at, he's at school at the minute. So uh, we're gonna kind of go down that order. And, um, and Alderman Page has to go somewhere. So I might kind of jump the order a little bit there. So uh, uh, Firefighter Al, uh, why don't you go ahead and give us whatever knowledge and whatever reasons you feel we, that the, the 911 system shouldn't be put together. And I still say there's a, uh, and that was confirmed by the public, uh, um, Linda Williams, who also sent a note to me saying that this most likely would have to go to a vote of the people to change the charter. So anyway, Demetrius, if you can go ahead, that would be nice. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and, and good afternoon, all the members on the Public Safety Committee. Uh, my name is Demetrius Alfred. I'm the president of Local 73, which represents all the firefighters, EMS, and uh, St. Louis Fire Department dispatchers. And uh, I would agree with the chairman saying uh, we, we, the locals, haven't been given a plan uh, how this would operate, how it would function, how the merger even works. Um, and so that was being said, you know, I'm, I'm not here to just uh, be negative about it. I don't know what the plan is. Uh, I'm not sure how it would work. Uh, I, knew, I, I know we have an obligation to uh, bargain and represent our members. And that goes beyond just uh, you know, benefits and pay. It also covers uh, job description, scope of work, physical location, and how performance will be evaluated along with pay benefits and discipline, you know, work rules. So we have a great concern because we haven't been shown the plan. We don't know how the merger works. Uh, with that being said, uh, I'll be totally transparent with you guys. I've been working really hard to try to find out what the plan is. Uh, I did sit in on a meeting yesterday and, and Friday that uh, Director of Public Safety asked members of uh, dispatch to come and he would enlighten them of the plan. And I was just an observer. And uh, there were a lot of questions thrown at the uh, director and uh, a lot of them weren't answered. Some were answered, a lot were not answered, and we really don't know exactly what the plan is other than to put them all in the same room, which we don't know how that works as well either. Uh, again, I agree with the chairman. There's some city charter rules that we think uh, can be violated by that. Uh, we also think that job classifications could be violated and, and such. So I could, I could go on and on and on. But really, uh, I don't, my biggest disappointment is that the plan wasn't shared with the local, uh, along with the SLPOA, because I told you I've been working, and I called those guys to see what they knew, how they felt about it, and they don't know much either. So um, the, I just wanted to come in and let the Public Safety Committee know that you, uh, we understand our obligation to bargain for our members, to protect our members. We, we want to do that, uh, along with we'd love the opportunity to see the plan and uh, you know, be a part of it to see what's going on. I don't know if it's a good plan or not, but uh, what, what I can say to you guys is if we get involved, if we can get involved and see the plan, we will make certain that uh, we, our members are protected and things are done correctly. But without seeing the plan right now, we don't know what to think. So if I was asked right now, if we were for it or against it, we'd be against it 
because we don't know exactly what it is. And until we do, we really can't speak, uh, you know, uh, educationally or positively about it. There's just too many questions that hasn't been answered. Well, don't feel bad. We, we, we are not informed either. We'll, we'll be the ones that have to fix it after they screw it up. Um, so, um, and, and I do know, uh, <clears throat> all the women Howard uh, texted me, uh, Paul Payne, are you on here with us somewhere? Yes, I am, Mr. Chairman. Okay, and I think uh, all the women Howard had some questions. Uh, let me defer real quick to the, uh, I, well, I, I wanted to, uh, before I do that, I did want uh, Alderman Stevenson, you had, I told you I would let you because you're actually going to have to get back to class. And he's not a committee member. So just, so he's not going to be asking questions, but to speak on the subject, I would assume. So if, if you would, then as a speaker, go for it. Yes, absolutely. And thank you for allowing me to speak. And please let me know if I start to get choppier or my video starts to lag. Um, not the best connection here, but I've had a few constituents reach out um, in overall support of the 911 merger, as well as in support of looking at how we can ameliorate our 911 system. But they did raise a few uh, concerns about both the speed of the process, the sort of planning of the process, and really the logistics of it. Not so much where it will be located, but how they're going to unify or how three different systems are ultimately going to be unified, three different pay grades, three different salaries are going to be unified. So I just wanted to come before this committee today and further that on behalf of my constituents who just reached out. They also noted a charter concern or a city code concern regarding the oversight of the 911 system, which per an ordinance that I could pull up right quick, my apologies committee for not having that up immediately, but um, that, uh, that questions whether or not the chief, uh, the firefighter chief, fire department chief needs to be better looped into it, um, Chief Yinkerson. So uh, that is all. I appreciate the ability to further these on behalf of my constituents, my neighbors to this committee um, and to present them as food for thought as we approach this process. So thank you, Chairman and thank you, Public Safety Committee. I yield back. Thank you. Um, so, uh, all the women, Howard, I'm just, uh, do you want to, do you have a question that we need to, should have Paul speak before we go down the, the list? Or do you want to just go um, down the list and ask whoever? I defer to you, Mr. Chair. Either way, I just, I, I want to, uh, uh, Paul's actually talking about something different. So let's, uh, you you do it the way you want to do it. I'm, I'm okay either way. All right. As always, I defer to my vice chairman, who's a lot more knowledgeable than me and a good smile. So, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, why don't you go ahead and I'm going to listen because I get too passionate. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in an attempt to ensure that this meeting is productive um, for everybody, I just want to be clear on when did the public safety director get notified of this hearing? We, 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 um, I, let's see, I, I had sent out something asking for the chief. I would have to ask uh, the uh, clerk Kennedy. I don't know that we actually asked the public safety director. He hasn't invited us to any of his meetings, but I figured that the ones that are gonna be the most knowledgeable, which you're, you're, you're as aware as I am. Every time we've tried to do something with the aldermen and get serious questions asked, just like when we were over at the uh, jail across the street, they try to control the scenario and they try to more or less show up so that I feel like people are afraid to speak. So in this case, I asked the chief. He said he couldn't come. I believe I... Rumors are that they're mad at the chief and without getting into any real detail, it seems to me that they're basically gonna intimidate anybody or bully, in my opinion, anybody that's gonna come in front of us and, and get. So I wanted the assistant chief or maybe the person running 911 and then they said they could make it. Then my understanding is that they were told 
that they can't come. So, I mean, at some point we may end up having to subpoena people to get them over here. But um, the way I felt is I want to find out what, what the facts, not what they say the facts are. I'd like the true facts on how this works. So I invited the chief who couldn't make it. Then it was the assistant chief and the director kind of that works in that 911 system. And then apparently they couldn't come. So I feel like well, if you saw that movie Rain, Rain Man, Rain Maker, I mean, or Let It Rain, I forget what it was, when all the witnesses just went out of town. Um, so no, so I did not ask him to come. I, I did not want them to control the scenario. I want to know what the facts are. And at right. the same time, they could invite us to a meeting and let us know. Maybe we'd know some facts that way. Um, I want to be hopeful that uh, the Public Safety Committee and uh, the Public Safety Director and everyone who reports to the Public Safety Director, we all can work together collaboratively. It seems that we have started out on a kind of a rocky start. Um, but uh, out of fairness, uh, to the public safety director, um, I think we probably should have requested the public safety director to come as well as everybody else, just just out of courtesy. And even if I feel like you don't really care much for me, it's not going to stop me from asking you to speak to the public about what we're doing as a city. Um, so I just kind of want to, to say that. Um, and. I am disappointed that nobody could really come on that team, especially uh, the chief or assistant chief, because I think we deserve an opportunity to know what the process looks like. I also think that we deserve an opportunity to know not only what the current system, how it works, but a potentially proposed system of how it might work. And you know, when people speak about transparency, you know, I just want to hold people accountable to that statement. I don't think it should be a sexy phrase in the spirit of transparency. And I'm transparent and transparent because I hear that so much around City Hall and, and it's starting to become just a sexy phrase, you know, to, to cure, you know, anxieties because you said it. so. And just because you say you're transparent doesn't mean you're transparent. And so I was looking forward to this discussion. I'm the one that actually requested to see it be up here to talk about their process, but on, on the 911, since we don't have anybody, but we do have a subject matter expert um, in Demetrius Alfred, you know, I was wondering if he would just kind of walk us through when somebody calls 911, how that call is picked up, um, how it's transferred. I mean, what that whole process looks like, because I'll tell you, most of my constituents probably didn't even know there was two different 911 systems. And for a long time, I didn't either until years ago. I mean, and you don't know if you dial 911 if you're calling police or you're calling uh, uh, fire. I mean, how would you know? I mean, so when that call comes in, Demetrius, if you don't mind, when a person dials 911, what happens after they hit send on their phone? Well, well, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman, and 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 let me be clear. I've I've never worked in dispatch, so I'm I'm just like you. I've I've gathered some information. Okay, and, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Just let hear me out. To the best of my knowledge, it, this is this is the truth. But uh, to my understanding, the nine one one call when a when a citizens dial nine one one, it goes to the police department uh, uh, center, and. The person that answers that, it, I believe, is called a call taker. And that call taker uh, says, you know, find out what the situation is and then gives the call out, meaning sends it to the police dispatch or sends it to fire dispatch or send it to EMS dispatch. Mm -hmm. That's my understanding of it. And if when I dig a little bit further, it appears that the problem is we don't have enough call takers is the reason why uh, be, people are being put on hold so much. Uh, that, that's my understanding. And uh, along with that, the compound situation, uh, there are some different 911 uh, 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 computer system that we're on, which means that uh, um, they're compatible, but
but they're not exactly the same. And, and like police may be on Motorola, fire is on, uh, I think it's called Clear Safe or something like that. Uh, one is a little bit older than the other. Um, they can communicate to each other, but they are different systems. So mm -hmm. I, I meant that to, to let you know that that's part of the problem as well, that manpower is a problem and uh, not being on the same system or upgraded to, to work better together is a problem as well. I, I hope that helps. Um, well, it, it, it's a little limited. I was hoping to hear more and I appreciate you saying, you know, that's really not your wheelhouse. So you going by what your understanding is as I can go by what my understanding may be. And um, I know if you live near the county line, you may call 911, it is picked up by a county dispatcher who then have to transfer you over to a city dispatcher, which can sometimes be frustrating and, and scary when it's an emergency. Um, and so then, and I just want to understand better the route, you know, of calls and how that, and, and then how it's even tracked. Um, because I think it's important when we look at even, you know, firefighters and how long it takes from the time the call went in to the time the fire truck arrived. I think there's a lag in how that time is actually calculated. Because if, if I make a 911 call and I'm looking at it's 10 o'clock and then the fire truck doesn't show to 1025, fire department would say, oh no, it took us seven minutes. And I'm thinking, no, that doesn't work. You know, that doesn't make sense. I mean, like somebody's cheating on time and they probably not. It just depends on how things are calculated. But in full transparency, I'm curious. And I think the public has a right to know and deserve to know what that, who calculates the time, when does the clock start? And, you know, when does the clock end on a particular call? Uh, I think it's important that we know what the average time is for a firefighter to show up. Um, firefighters are oftentimes the first responder to, to whatever call, whether it's a dumpster fire or a heart attack. I mean, they oftentimes beat the ambulance there um, and equipped to, to stabilize a person until an EMS can actually get there. Um, it, it doesn't look like we're going to have an opportunity to really, you know, take a deep dive into what this system looks like in, in a meaningful way to me. I'm just the vice chair and a, and a member of this committee, but uh, Mr. Chairman, I would certainly be interested in scheduling a meeting whereby we can actually have the public safety director, we can actually have the chief of police, the um, fire chief, the um, dispatcher for fire, dispatcher for police, because one of the issues I'm, 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 I'm told about, because I know some people that work in dispatch, that uh, when it comes to pay, there's no parity on pay. And I'm not sure, I forget who makes more than who. I think fire makes more than police. Is that right, Demetrius? Yeah, yes, sir. And, and the reason okay. for that, if I, I'll be real brief on that. Uh, back when the fire department got parity with the police department, and there's a court decision on a Supreme Court decision, um, the dispatchers were part of the fire department. So their, their pay parity, the dispatchers, are equal uh, with the police, just like a regular firefighter. The, the reason why EMS dispatchers or EMS, EMS itself isn't included in that is because at that particular time when that court case was won, they were actually under the health department. They were not part of the fire department. Mm. Okay, so, so, yeah, I remember, I think it was Clarence yeah. Harmon administration that switched them from health department to uh, the fire department, if I remember correctly. I, uh, I believe you. Yeah, and so, but, but so if we're going to combine um, police dispatchers with firefighter dispatchers, I mean, I think it's important that people would have parity. I mean, I don't think it's fair that I don't know how much they make, but if somebody's making five dollars more than the next person or sitting there doing the same job, that doesn't seem to be equitable. And you know what we keep hearing oftentimes is another sexy word, equality, right? And so I'm curious to know how do we solve that hiccup with if we're going to blend? I mean, we don't know if it's going to happen or not, but I think it's worth having discussion. So I want to applaud the administration for even being willing to have the discussion because of the discussion that needs to be had because we are short on both sides. So bringing them into one house, as far as I'm concerned, 
makes sense, but processes everything. So how do we do that in a way that everybody feels like their voices were heard and that they benefit from it as well as the city as a whole? So that's that's kind of like my position on that. And again, Mr. Chairman, I, I you know I, if we can you know have another meeting you know to to deal with nine one one because you know we gave enough time to reach out to the public safety director and, and all of his staff. I think that would be helpful because this is very critical, meaningful discussion that we're having right now. So that's that's just a request that I would have, and then I would I would yield back. So uh, is the clerk here with us, Terry? Are you here? I don't know if she's here. <clears throat> Trita, can you pass along the to uh, have all of those people that the vice chairman asked for? to set up a meeting for uh, next week. I'll need two meetings next week because I already want one to deal with uh, some other issues. Um, if it's possible, I would like to have two public safety meetings next week. And uh, I would like the public safety director, the police chief, the fire chief, um, uh, uh, Everyone, everyone that conceivably is uh, uh, works with the 911 system, uh, you know. Uh, and Paul, I'm going to have you because when we come around this, Paul, maybe you could speak to the pay differences between the one and the other. So, uh, so I guess we'll move on. We're, we're going to move on down the line because I think. We also going to have that other. Uh, so let's see here. All the women that Davis, you're next on the list here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee and the public. I really don't have a lot to share with you. Um, Alderman Boyd uh, pretty much uh, had my same thoughts. I think we should have a comprehensive meeting. I think that um, we should also not rush this, it may take more than one meeting. Uh, and just to remind those of us who've been around for a while, this is not the first time we've had this conversation. Uh, the, the lengthiest one we had uh, is, I think it was three to four years ago. So we know there's a need there. We've explored it in uh, different ways. I think we're closer now to getting some uh, finality to it, but uh, I can understand the apprehension of employees and public if they don't thoroughly understand. But um, we are an antiquated system. We are probably anywhere from 10 to 15 years behind in process from other cities. So it's something that we need to do. But one thing I will not support is that we do something patchwork and that we don't totally come to the 21st century. If you're gonna do it, if you're gonna change it, bring us totally up to date. Those are my only comments, sir, thank you. And I appreciate that. And uh, we're being left out of it anyway. So when you talk about many meetings, this system, they're gonna do what they wanna do without us, the way I feel. I, well, that's impossible because if the legislation is not passed, it won't happen. Uh, so I don't, think we don't they, like they, I don't feel they need any legislation to pass it. I think uh, they, will they, need some. they can do what they want. Just, just my, just my thoughts. I'm sorry. I'm going to move on down the line. I, I, and that's why I should really have the vice chairman do this. Cause I'm going to have a lot of opinions. In fact, vice chairman, why don't you take over? And I'm just going to listen because I will have my own thoughts that I'll keep throwing in there. Next on the list would be uh, all the women Howard and I'm, I'm gonna let the vice chairman take over because I'm somewhat passionate on this. So, so now, do you want me to speak now, or do you want to? Uh, yeah, I think. Well, I'm gonna. Yeah, you can speak with. Okay, and then all the men, okay. vice chairman Boyd's gonna take over from here. Okay. I'm gonna all right. Mute myself. I have I I just want to state that I'm somewhat disappointed that you know this is. 
truly a 911 emergency we're dealing with here when, when we're talking about people's lives and livelihoods and so forth. Um, and I'm a little dismayed that we haven't gotten uh, some better communication from the director of public safety. Uh, we, we got a letter and it says that they've been meeting since 2019. I don't know that we've been aware of that, but you know, if, if we've been meeting since 2019 and as the older woman from the 19th stated, it shouldn't be a rush. We should be well underway on getting this thing changed and, and working more efficiently and effectively and, and serving the citizens of St. Louis with, with a, a working 911 service that they pay for in their taxes. With that said, um, I just have a question of Mr. Alfred. Um, maybe he knows, maybe he doesn't. Um, the 911 service is overseen by the uh, fire chief, is that correct? According to city charter? Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, and so if, if the, how did the police come under that? Do you know the history or how that came to be or I, and now I'm putting you on the spot, but I just don't know if I don't know if you know, but I, I, I don't know, which I think is very interesting. And I kind of think maybe that uh, it had to do with the call boxes back in the day. So but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> that, that, that's kind of the magic question, uh, uh, the woman Howard, and I've been trying to pull that up. Uh, you can remember back in the day, like you said, the pull boxes for the fire department. And I don't uh, remember that. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. My, my mistake. I remember. But but let me say this. Uh, I also remember when 911 came into existence. And uh, I, I believe the charter was written before that, which gave the fire chief the, these powers. Now, when 911 came into existence, I, I believe, and I'm not certain, I tell you, I've been doing some digging, but uh, um, it, it was handed to the police department, I believe, because a lot of the calls were for police. So I thought that, I think the thought was it'll go to their center first because their center is the biggest. They receive the bulk of the calls, if you will. And when you see the bulk, I'm mm -hmm. not shaming the fire department or EMS at all. What I'm saying is if EMS is getting 80,000 80, 80, calls a year and fire is receiving, let's say 55 or 60,000, I believe, and we're just talking calls, we're not saying runs, and, and, and the police department could possibly be getting uh, uh, a few hundred thousand calls. So I believe in that aspect, uh, the the first 911 contact would be the police department. But like I said, it doesn't go directly to the police department. It's in their call center, but they have, I, I called it a call taker, but I think it's called a call evaluator that answers that phone. And that person from that point says, okay, you need the fire, you need police, you need EMS. And then it directs it. So I believe that's how they came about. I haven't found any documents that states that. I'm going off of what I can find out from my dispatchers and being around for such a long time. Okay. That said, now does the um, fire the firefighters or your uh, representative uh, organization have any? Um, idea I, and do you want to stay this way do you have any uh, uh opinions or or stance on whether this should be changed or not or is i know you know since you don't know anything you're somewhat opposed but going down further would would you you know just be opposed to this because you wouldn't want the firefighters taking uh losing control of it <laughs> Do you have an opinion either way, or do your member does your membership? All the moment, how you know me, you know I have an opinion, absolutely, and 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 I'm not necessarily opposed to those guys working all in a what we call a PSAP center. I believe in in this conversation, I've heard a lot of uh, different discussions, and, and I think they're at different moments and times because there have been meetings going on for a while. And the fire department has been part of some of those meetings. We think that the current situation that's happening, a lot of people weren't involved in that because we've had an administration change from one mayor to the next. So, so that's a little bit different of opinion. But uh, on that question, straight on, uh, what I would call a PSAP center, we would definitely be in favor of. Uh, and and with uh, the older woman from the 19th award said that. Um, you know, 
we're behind the times. That is true because there are PSAP centers around the country that could house everybody and they're upgraded and they're, they're great. I mean, we would love to go there. Uh, what we're saying about this particular plan here, which we don't have a copy of, we're just going off of, uh, just like the chairman said, there's a lot of different rumors. Uh, a lot of my members called me and say, hey, they're telling me to show up at this meeting. Can you attend? I, I'll ask the attend to sit in. They're being told some things, but it, it, it appears it hasn't been totally thought out, transparent, and we would have questions of the legalities of a lot of things, the city charter, job classifications, uh, 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 discipline, all, all types of stuff. This stuff hasn't been talked out. All we heard is in a newspaper article that we were merging and it will be done by a specific date. And that's where all the confusion comes from. You, you, we got people running scared saying, what the hell? Am I losing my position? What's going on? And that's why we were called and we had to start doing some digging. But to be right open with you, I haven't, the local hasn't been given the plan that's currently being talked about. And we don't know what really to think, but we do think the idea uh, putting people in a PSAP center together, the total dispatch is a good idea if it's done correct. Um, just one more. Uh, for, for those of us that are not acronymic, acronymically disabled, what does PSAP stand for? Oh, you put me on a spot. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Public safety. Um, uh, um, I, I, have to get it. I would have to get it for you, but basically. Public safety point. Public safety all points. Access they, point. point. Public safety answering point. Okay. They, they, Thank you, and Mr. That, that, that would be the dispatch center for police fire and EMS. And, and we think there's a huge advantage in that, but we still have to cover, you know, job classifications, make sure the rules are right, make sure the place is safe, all, all types of stuff. And, and, and really, like I said, on this plan, what we're hearing, and I haven't been given the plan, so we're just going off what we're hearing. We do have a bunch of red flags up. Thank you very much. And that's all I have, uh, Mr. Chair. Sorry. Okay. Uh, next up is, sorry about that, I'm multitasking here, is Alderwoman Spencer. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I, you know, I, I share some of my colleagues, uh, just, you know, comments about having some of the leadership here. And I'm grateful that we're going to move forward with this. this is such an important issue. And I'm, I'm, I'm really just happy to see us talking about it. I'd like to make a request on a separate issue, um, if the chair is still present. Um, and that is regarding the Teneo report. I think it would be helpful to have an update on where we are on that. It was a report that was that's so well outlined, um, you know, the steps that the city can and should take to uh, improve the public safety of our community um, and just hadn't heard about that for a little bit. And I think it would be worthwhile to take a look at where we are with those, those steps outlined in that. That's all I have, Mr. Vice Chair. I appreciate the conversation. I look forward to continuing it with some of the uh, public safety leadership involved in, in discussing with us. Auto and Pam Boyd. Uh, I, okay, so uh, what I'm hearing is it's been communication going on, uh, Demetrius, since 2019 in regards to this uh, merging. So who was at the table? That's a great question. I, I, I'm not certain. I, the union hasn't been represented in those conversations, I could say that. Uh, I, I do, like I said, from administration to the mayor's office, changed from one administration to the next. Mm -hmm. I know before the new administration came in, the fire department was involved, the fire chief's office was involved in some talks about a, a total PSAP center to the tune of uh, they, they were working on the funding and some more FPs were being uh, made up. Uh, but once the administration changed, didn't hear anything until we're having these conversations, which we haven't been a part of at all. Okay, and then uh, okay, I, I think that's all. I, and I'm kind of agree, agreeing with my other colleagues. 
I guess my frustration is it seems like as a city, we always uh, piecemeal stuff instead of looking at what the issue is and trying to address it and make it a correction to make it right. And, and I don't see that happens. I, I just see we always piecemealing things and then we're stumbling because we didn't check all our, uh, cross our T's and dot our I's. As Autumn Woman Davis said, I would love for us as a city to be brought up to the 21st century, 22nd century, the 20th century. But it just seems like, you know, we're always behind the eight ball and then we're always pushing time to try to get things done. So thank you, uh, Mr. Alfred, I appreciate it. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay, next up is Alderman Bison. Alderman Bison, I see him. Alderman Bison, you're on mute. Okay, we're gonna come back to Alderman Bison. Let's go to uh, Alderman Page. I know he has to leave at one o'clock. So I'm gonna go to Alderman Page and I'll come back to Alderman Bison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you, Mr. Alfred, for uh, joining us today. Uh, I appreciate uh, your being with us. I made a couple of notes on uh, what you brought to us. Uh, first and foremost, you had concerns about city charter violations, or potentially so, uh, that you have not seen the merger plan, that you're are forced to be against the plan until you see it and learn about it and understand it. And also that uh, the union was not at the table uh, in discussions of the 911 merger, which allegedly have occurred since 2019. Do I have you uh, recorded in my notes correctly? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, with that, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, I, I don't have any further questions. I'm looking forward to additional meetings with public safety leaders to gain some more understanding about this plan and where we're going. Uh, I think the Board of Aldermen should be at the table and involved in the planning processes. Thank you. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Alderman Page. Uh, we'll go back to Alderman Bosley if he's there. Okay, we're gonna to go to Alman Muhammad. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. I have no questions. I fully support the union and their recommendation on how, on how this thing should be laid out. Uh, 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 so I have nothing else. If I can do anything, Mr. Demetrius, please let me know. Uh, and please thank you and thank all of your firefighters for the work that you guys do. That's all, Mr. Vice Chairman, thank you. Thank you, okay. Alderman Oldenburg. Alderman Oldenburg. Okay, Alderman the right. Thank you, Vice Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Alfred. I'll say just because we're in the uh, in the meeting here. <laughs> um, so I, I I have had some uh, some folks from uh, Local Seventy Three express some concerns to me about this, and it sounds like maybe some of it is just that. Uh, uh, folks feel like they're, they're a bit in the dark here. I do agree with some of my colleagues that uh, we certainly do need to have a further hearings with the director of public safety and the chiefs of uh, both the police department and fire department here. But while I have you here, uh, if I could ask you a few questions, I'd appreciate it just so I could get some more knowledge on this. Sure. Um, so at the moment, how would transferring manpower away from uh, uh, fire dispatch affect fire and EMS, the fire and EMS divisions? Wow, that's a great question. Um, right now, um, the, the, see, that, that's, that's one of our main topics when we talk about this. Since we haven't seen a plan, we're speculating. But if you were to move fire dispatch out of its building, right now, fire dispatch, to my knowledge, is about eight folks short itself. So uh, how we've been surviving is uh, we've had 
some firefighters that have gone on light duty before and have uh, trained and obtained uh, the knowledge to be a backup uh, dispatcher. So right now we're currently operating eight short and we're backfilling uh, dispatch with firefighter uh, manpower. Uh, if you move those dispatchers out of headquarters, I, it's my belief that, that oh. firefighters cannot back up uh, a different job classification if that job classification was changed. Like I said, we don't know the plan, so we're not certain we're speculating, but it, I, I think that moving uh, fire dispatchers out of headquarters only uh, multiplies the problem of manpower that the police already has. Understood. And then, so, so you mentioned that you're, you're eight people short at the moment. Uh, how, have, how have you and fire dispatch managed your own shortages then? That, that, that's the backfield with the firefighters that have trained and obtained the licensures to work in dispatch. And, and, and if I can explain that more, firefighters, uh, for, for, for firefighters in the city of St. Louis uh, have an opportunity to, to help the citizens, uh, you know, at, at every turn, meaning we do other duties like uh, get licenses for EMT, which when I came on the job, you didn't have to have. Uh, some guys even go further and get licenses to be uh, paramedics, uh, things like that. And we backfill EMS, let's say on the ambulance, uh, at, at overtime cost, but we backfill when they're short and we're, we're starting to do that in dispatch as well. So we would, you know, our guys, and, and, and uh, let me just say this, right? we got a lot of great guys. We do as much as we can for the department in the city of St. Louis. Uh, uh, that's a blanket statement. I mean, you get, you sure you got a few bad apples or a few people that are disgruntled, but for the most part, uh, most of the members try to do as much as they can to, to make the fire department work to the best of its ability for the cities of St. Louis. So uh, we have a number of people who are still interested and possibly trying to learn things and help backfill. Uh, we'd really like to hire some folks and, and get them in there. We know what that problem is across the country. So that's why we have the situation we have. But if you move those guys out of there, if you move dispatch out of headquarters, I mean, we have to follow the rules. We, we think that that manpower shortage will definitely be felt uh, twice the times because you move them out of building and then you give them the more duties. I gotcha. So so basically what you're saying, it, 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 and if I'm wrong, please, please correct me here. Uh, so if I'm a, if I'm a firefighter and, uh, you know, my typical day is to, you know, ride around on the truck putting out fires and stuff. And I, I, I break my foot doing something. Uh, then during the time that, that I'm in that cast, and I can't uh, uh, be out there, you know, fighting fires and uh, doing all that, then I may kind of supplement the dispatchers during that time? Am, am it, I... It's not an automatic deal, but let's say, okay, in that scenario, that firefighter goes to the hospital, gets the cast put on, uh, be evaluated, and let's say the first couple of weeks, because it's it's a broken foot or something, they may be told they need to stay at home, don't move it, elevate it. But that third week, when they're starting to get better, then uh, the doctor may say, you can be open to not go back on the fire truck, but you can do light duty. Now, this is where it gets interesting. When you go to light duty, you go to headquarters. Uh, light duty means answer phones, uh, 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 mail run, uh, whatever needs to be done down at headquarters. And let's say if there's an opportunity where you can do some studying and pass the test to answer phones, because you just, then not just anybody can answer a phone and dispatch. You, you have to pass a test, but those guys will get on that track, start studying, learn how to do things, get cross trained, and then once they're certified, yes. They can backfill dispatch. Understood. Um, so have the has the fire department upgraded the dispatching capabilities of fire and EMS uh, at any time recently? Yes, sir. Uh, and and I could recall the system. I'm gonna try to recall the system here. I think it's called Central Square, uh, which is a CAD provider, has been upgraded. Uh, to bring it more so in the 21st century. The uh, reason why it's not perfect is because it's, it's not totally compatible across the board, but, but it, does, it does bring us in the 21st century. Uh, fire and EMS down at headquarters have opportunity to communicate a lot better. And then there's some backup plans with that, like some handheld uh, radios uh, that people will pick up and talk to a dispatcher from another department immediately 
and that seemed to be helping as well. And so part part of fire dispatch, if I have this correct from the, the conversations I've had with, with some of my constituency, part of fire dispatch is called fire alarm. Yes, and, fire alarm is the fire suppression. Okay. And so they have at a fire alarm, they have some specific training that uh, the police dispatchers may not have in terms of the uh, uh, the technology, I guess, that the fire department is using on on fires. How how the what what gear and teams need to be sent to any given situation? Is that correct? A absolutely. Uh, that 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 not only comes up with seniority, and I should have mentioned seniority earlier, because seniority is very important. But yeah, uh, that that knowledge uh, is specifically for the fire department is invaluable, and uh, that when a person gets into dispatch, uh, they, they, they have to train and, and, and really study to, to get that type of knowledge. And there's also life-saving knowledge that has to be uh, learned also to talk a person possibly through um, how to do CPR or how to sustain a person that's giving birth, Th those type of things. I mean, there's added pressure. Uh, there's a, there's a psychological stuff we try to teach folks on how to de-escalate uh, situations over the phone, how to calm folks down, and how to not lose uh, your wits while you're on the phone. So yeah, there's a number of things. Now, I, and let me just say this too: I'm not taking any way uh, uh, anything away from the police dispatch. Sure, uh, sure I haven't certainly. had the opportunity to work over there. I'm sure they have some of the. But but you asked specifically about fire, and yes, the the life saving aspect of it is very invaluable. Absolutely. Oh, and uh, I, I certainly just to to uh, uh, reiterate and kind of let you off the hook there. I, I wasn't uh, saying uh, to compare one to the other. I'm sure that the police department has some specialized training that maybe the fire dispatchers don't have. Um, but I, uh, my, my understanding from talking to, uh, to, to someone at Fire Alarm was, uh, you know, knowing uh, how many teams to send, the specifics of what kind of trucks to send uh, can all be, uh, uh, invaluable, especially when, when you think about the, uh, the rate of speed at which a, a building can be consumed by a fire. Uh, it's kind of important to get it right the first time. Um, Absolutely. And so then lastly, when it comes to uh, the union itself at 73, um, there's some pretty specific job descriptions, are there not? Oh yeah, definitely. And really, that, that's why, I, like I said, I don't want to make this too, uh, uh, you know, terrible, like this is just a horrible idea. But we don't know if those things were looked at. We know what we have to protect. Uh, we know that um, um, we know that we've been working at a, a rate of pay for a long time also. And if you want to add things to, to do these and things, I mean, that's that's what the union is here for, the bargain and talk about, you know, what things may be worth and, and how we can time it out and make sure that it makes sense that people are not being overworked or being overloaded. So, yeah, that, that, that all that is very important. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I have to imagine that if 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 I'm a person who uh, is, is in a union and I've bargained for a specific duty and wages associated with that, and I'm a card carrying member of uh, 73, and then I get told in addition to these fire calls, you're gonna be taking on police calls, that could potentially set us up for a whole lot of litigation, potentially, I imagine, um, because we'd be you know, essentially outside of our our agreement with the uh, with the locals, absolutely, absolutely, and and that and that's a in my opinion would be a worst case scenario. I don't know if that's going on, and and really I'm trying to be fair about this situation, but that is a possibility. Understood. Yeah, and, you know, I, I I also I don't have a uh, a real understanding of what's going on. I'm just trying to figure out where the guardrails uh, uh, are as far as the fire department is concerned. Um, absolutely. And I, I certainly look forward to uh, to more discussions on this as we move forward, particularly once we have the opportunity to uh, to hear from the director of public safety and uh, Chief Jenkerson and Chief Hayden. Uh, and uh, I thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to uh, to uh, further conversations on the matter. And with that, I'll yield.
Thank you okay, for the opportunity. Thank you. And Alderman Clark Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chairman. I don't, my colleague from the 24th really touched on all my concerns and asked all my questions. So thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Demetrius, for being on here. And I'm just still I'm gathering the information and trying to help process move forward. Now, all the woman, uh, so this, what you're talking about between you and all the from the 20, is that like telepathy? Is, no. Is that, <laughs> that what was going on? <laughs> Not telepathy, but I do have some. I have some constituents who are dispatchers that have some of the same concerns. And again, my conference from the twenty fifth touched on them all. Um, thank you, thank you. So it wasn't telepathy. I guess we just share. Uh, I think we share some of the same concerns. We can put it like that. <laughs> the great mass think alike, right? <laughs> right. There we go. Okay, um, we've gone through the committee. Can't seem to get. Uh, Alderman Bosley's attention. So I'm going to go off the committee. Uh, Alderman Evans has her hand up to speak. Okay, uh, wait a minute, Alderman Evans. Oh, you don't have your hand up. I see one. Okay, you can take it down now. Um, we'll go back to Alderman Page. It's going one minute. Go ahead, Alderman Page. You have some follow-up questions? Uh, no, no follow-up. Just wanted to let everybody know, uh, thanks for the information provided. I've got to hustle to my next meeting uh, to be continued. Okay, I see other members of the board on. Uh, if they have a question, just raise your hand. Or I, I'm just gonna do a roll call on who I see. Uh, all the women, right? You have any questions or comments? I apologize. Sorry. Um, I was really just here trying to figure out what was going on, and um, I was also forwarded the letter from uh, Director Isom, and I think. That helps put it a little bit into context for me. Um, so I'm looking forward to learning more about what it is that we're trying to do to modernize the 911 system and um, hope that we can continue some more robust hearings. Thanks so much. Yes, me too. Thank you. All woman swipe, sir. Nothing, Dad. Thank you. Okay. Um, Alderman Oldenburg, are you there? I am. I, I have no questions. Thank you, Alderman. Okay. Alderman Bosley, one last time, and then I'm going to go back to the chairman to see if he wants to wrap this up. Alderman Bosley. Okay, uh, Alderman Evans has, she was going to ask something. She said no. I saw her hand, but she said no. I called on her. Uh, Alderman Bosley. Not um, by Alderman. Oh, I'm sorry. I see Alderman Gracia. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I just wanted to echo, I think, the sentiments of most of our colleagues. I appreciate this issue being brought to our attention. And um, 911 calls are one of the top requests or complaints I get with respect um, to constituents being concerned. I had a newborn baby um, a while back whose um, parents brought them to the hospital themselves because they could not get through to um, through the 911 call center. So I appreciate everyone's time and effort on this and looking forward to working um, holistically to address this um, finally, because it's long overdue. Thank you. Okay, thank you for sharing. Uh, Alderman Baccaro, Chairman Baccaro. Yeah, just, uh, I, I listened to what Alderman Ryan had said, and uh, one of the things that, you know, in talking to dispatchers, fire and, and police both, they talk different languages, there's a giant pay disparity, but, they don't just send a fire truck. If the house is on fire, they don't just say, okay, we'll send a fire truck and hang up. My understanding in talking to fire dispatchers, they have to send the Laclede gas company. They have to determine if more fire trucks are needed. They have to make sure that, you know, all these different utilities, because uh, you're not going to go to a house fire that, you know, Laclede gas hasn't been notified. I, I see this is I think I see this as a, a major problem. I think somebody's going to get hurt. I, I don't think you're going to, you have to have a licensed medical to be a fire dispatcher. You don't need that to be a police dispatcher. So 
what are we gonna do? Yell around the room? Hey, does any uh, is anybody uh, capable on this one? You know, I, I see this as as something that's gonna come back, just like the uh, workhouse, just like the the police. That it's just gonna come back. And and what my concerns from the beginning of this is that not only the unions now I see that uh, this group has been left out. A letter was sent to us this morning. We could have been invited to other meetings and I have asked, and so has the press asked, why hasn't the any of the public safety, including me? And the answer from the mayor's office was, it doesn't concern his ward, so he has no business in it. They, total disrespect, you know, of what we're getting. Just that's what has me aggravated. We should have had a seat at the table on all of these things. So I just, just throwing that out there. And, and unless someone else has a follow-up question, I think we'll move on to the CSB. Uh, Mr. Chairman, okay. let me ask this, because uh, yeah. I believe you invited uh, Mr. Paul Payne. I like to call yeah, I'm Mr. sorry. Paul Payne. And I didn't know if you wanted him to make some comments in regard to whatever well, your thoughts were. You're still in charge. I was just had my hand up to answer it, to ask a question. So you're still in charge. Uh, well, I'm asking you, did you want to hear from uh, Sam on her Paul Payne? I think it'd be a good idea. I think all the uh, women Paul, especially. I, uh, can I, I would like to know from Paul Payne what um, budgetary uh, moves have been made to fund a new 911. Is there anything gone with that? Or has he gotten any information from the citizens board about 911? Those are the two questions I had and was wanting to know about. Okay, so what we're going to do. I don't know, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. I just. Yeah, we're going to just um, get some comments from uh, Mr. Payne and then we'll just ask members of the committee and seniority if they have any particular questions based on his thoughts and what he knows Thank about you. what's going on. So, Mr. Payne, good evening, good afternoon, sir. After, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Always good a pleasure time. to be in your company. I, I call, every time Paul Payne appears, there's a learning opportunity. <laughs> so, especially when it deals with our city budget and money. So, <laughs> Paul, why don't you tell us kind of like what you know or what you're working on around this subject? Sure, yeah, I, I have, again, when I got the invite for this meeting, I wasn't quite sure what, what where you wanted to go. Um, yeah, I have not been involved with the, 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 the operational discussions that you've been making, but I have been involved on the capital side and uh, what we've been doing, as you are all aware, we've been meeting with the Citizen Advisory Committee as well as the Capital Committee and making presentations of proposed capital projects one of which is the uh, design and construction of a, a, a PSAP uh, center, which was, as we discussed earlier, as a public safety answering point. But basically what it's doing is combining all the 911 uh, dispatchers and all into a single location and addressing some of the techno, uh, technology needs that we have for that function and hopefully getting some efficiencies out of that. Um, I, I actually, I, I do have that presentation and if you're, Interested. It's, it is posted online underneath the capital committee, but I, I could pull it up if you, you want to see it. Uh, but, sure. Yeah. Sure. Would you do that, Paul? Sure. Just to bring it up to speed, because everybody is not really participating on the capital committee, so it'd be interesting to to know what's Let's available to I us can. and what opportunities. Let's see if I can do this here. Has it come up? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is just a brief presentation that uh, uh, folks from public safety made on, on uh, what is to be a proposed combination of all those functions from police, fire, EMS, as well as SEMA into a single location. Now we have not gotten into the operational considerations that you're all discussing today. We're, we're focused mostly on the capital needs side. Um, but as you can see, 
and, and there's e even a CSB component, which would address uh, what your latter topic is. But basically, what it is is a, um, a single location to combine all the uh, functions in one spot. Uh, the identified location would be uh, right near police head. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, fire department headquarters uh, on Jefferson. Right now, there's some property that's uh, under the city ownership. Right now, that's behind that uh, facility, um, and there's a estimated cost as well as project schedule. Uh, this was something that was being explored over the last few years. Uh, it has been on hold. One, one, a couple of reasons. One, when the, uh, the pandemic started, everything was put on hold, and also the funding source became uncertain. So that was also put on hold. But it's hoped that we can get design and uh, design initiated with some of these funds that are becoming available as well as construction uh, and, and uh, over the next several years. Um, and it's an estimated project cost of $32 million. And, and uh, right now under contract is about 2.4 million for a design, but, it, but it's dependent upon additional funding. And so we haven't spent that much uh, yet. And that was from previous year's fundings. Um, but that's, that's basically what we're talking about in terms of capital uh, combining those, uh, those functions under one roof. And, and hopefully that, uh, and again, that doesn't address the labor side of it, but it, it does address the, uh, the, the physical location proximity and, and, and provides the opportunity not only for uh, efficiencies working under the same roof, but also getting us the, the latest and greatest in terms of technology. Okay. And um, Paul, is, is there any way that that process could be accelerated instead of, you know, taking the projected time period? Is there any way we can cut that in half? Um, well, I, I, no, I, I think with any, well, first of all, we do have to do the appropriation process, but I think that, but the design and construction, it, that, that takes whatever that normal time would be. I mean, so uh, I, I think when they laid out that uh, initial schedule, it was how much time do you need to make sure you've got the design, you've got the site prepped and all that kind of thing so that you can do it. Now, if we are using mostly ARPA funds, there is a deadline for that. Uh, so we have to have everything obligated within three years or under contract. And then you've got another additional two years actually have it spent so that would be within the next five. So, um, so in terms of getting that physical structure built and designed and built, that was the, uh, the estimates that I, I uh, were presented uh, by the Board of Public Service in, in this project. But operationally, I imagine you do, do whatever you need to do prior to actually having the physical location. And, and so I'm glad you brought up how we could potentially fund this. So under ARPA, um, is there a specific bucket that we can draw from under the ARPA funds um, that's specific to this? Or, because I know there's about four buckets and one of them is, is the reimbursement the city would get from, you know, lost revenue, which I think you said was maybe $170 million. Is that about right? About 150 or 150, so. 150, yeah. right. So, so could it, it, would it potentially come out of that bucket or another bucket that's specific to public safety um, within the whole bucket of ARPA funds? Well, there's, uh, the, from the capital standpoint, it would be the, the lost revenue. Uh, okay. okay. Operationally, there is another bucket that pr provides a premium pay for public safety uh, personnel, which may be involved, but that's that's a separate, that's a separate. Let me ask you this, Paul, even, even, um, the reimbursement, the 150 reimbursement, I mean, it kind of goes back to general revenue, right? Well, there is no requirement you know, one way or the other how it gets spent. It, it's pretty broad in terms of its uses. So, it, right. so no, regardless of where the shortfall occurred, the source uh -huh. of the shortfall, there is no requirement. It goes back to that particular fund or anything. So, uh, the, 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 that writing was pretty broad in terms of how okay. the city utilizes that. So in a nutshell, it's kind of discretionary. And, and, uh, and we potentially could use it for operation. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Let me ask committee members that have any questions. I know we need to get on to CSB. Uh, Alderman Davis, do you have any questions of Dr. Paul Payne? No, the only thing I wanted uh, to express and or have Paul clarify is the process itself, as far as determining 
all those questions that are of concern of employees and all of that, that's an in-house thing that we do separately from creating the opportunity to enhance IT and services. And so as we move forward, we'll get all of that, but it can't be done totally upfront. And that's where I, I wanted to go back and I hope when we have these uh, future meetings that we start with where we had the, the beginning of this conversation, which was really, um, and everybody's talking about 2019, but it was really before that. And we've talked about it periodically in ways and means budgeting and uh, over the years, um, fire department, police department, wanting to be updated with this system and technology is what's going to drive all of this. How a call comes in, keywords will send that call to the right place. Those, it's a lot of involved here, and it's not based on how we've been doing it in the antiquated way of a singular individual making a decision. IT will help. So I'm looking forward to these conversations. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Howard. Any follow-up? Um, I, I do, yes. Um, Mr. Payne, I, I guess I, my question to you is, you've been working with the Citizen Committee. Is this something that is, has proven to be um, a primary concern of the, the Citizens uh, Committee? Yeah, I, I think it, it's fair. And we've been doing surveys and, and talking about it. I, I think it's fair to say this one rates pretty highly up on there, on the list. Mm -hmm concerns. So I guess the thing is you're you're dealing with the logistics of how to get it funded and, and the plans to be made for a place. Um, and and our our deal would be to deal with the human resources factor through personnel and the city charter. Um, and I, you don't have to answer that. So and I think that's what we need to focus on as a committee here is is um, looking at ways to implement a um, smooth operating system with the personnel we have and, and negotiating with our police and fire unions to see if we can't get fair wages for, for both and have some consolidation here. Um, it seems that you know we backed into this before and I hope we learn from the past and not back into this again and have a disjointed system that doesn't serve our constituency well. So hopefully, uh, as we move forward, we can take a leadership position here and, and get things underway to um, provide some conversations for going forward with the unions that represent the people involved and personnel. So thank you so much for, for your information and I appreciate your time, Mr. Mr. Payne, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alderman Pam Boyd. Alderman Boyd. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you heard me. Uh, <clears throat> no questions. I, uh, a lot of the questions were asked and answered. And as usual, Mr. Payne was very thorough on giving us the information. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Sure. Okay, Alderman Bison. I think Alman Bison just, oh, here he comes. No, I'm, no, 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 I'm here. I am having people walk in and out of my office. My apologies. <laughs> Any questions of Mr. Payne? Um, not necessarily uh, right this second. I know there's a, can you hear me well? Uh-huh. Okay, sir. So I, I know there's a lot going on, especially between um, uh, the kind of the communi communication practices between departments right now. Um, I do myself, um, and this is a question for the commenting on uh, CSB and uh, the departments, right? Well, we have no, we're not on CSB yet. We're talking about uh, 911 system. Okay, got you, got you. Yeah, yeah, my apologies. Um, I, I appreciate all the hard work everybody's doing. Um, just looking forward to, to continuing conversation and, and, you know, hearing more about different directions we can go in and make things work uh, better. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, most Alderman of my Muhammad. questions have been answered, though. Appreciate you. Alderman Muhammad? 
Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. I have no questions of the director. Thank you for all you do, Mr. Director. All right, Alderman Oldenburg. Alderman Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I don't have any questions for uh, Dr. Payne, but I did want to thank him for being here. And I'm sure that I will have questions for him as this process moves forward. So uh, thanks for thanks for being here today. All woman, Clark Hubbard. No questions, thank you. Um, page is gone. Uh, let's see if we have members not on the committee. Um, all women in Gracia. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. No questions, but appreciate your time, Paul, as always. Okay. I think uh, uh, all women Evans. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have no questions at this time. I took good notes and hope to see. Uh, some of the things that were said come to fruition. Thanks everyone okay. that was at this meeting today. Okay, so uh, we're gonna move on to CSB. Before that, I just wanna say, um, I'm actually excited about the possibilities. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if it can be done, if it ever will be done, but I do remember when um, Clarence Harmon administration transferred EMS from the health department to the fire department. And I believe that worked out in the best interest of the city. Uh, I believe it served the city well. Uh, Demetri, just do yes or no if you disagree or if you agree. You know, I, 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 I'm enjoying it. The only, let me just say this real quick. The only thing I, I just wish uh, we could, we could get a classification for EMS so we can have total integration. I think right. we no, were. No, I got that. I got that. My point was, when it went from the health department to the fire department, did that serve the city better? Oh, absolutely. Are you okay. kidding me? Okay. Okay, great. So my point is, I'm sure back in the 90s when that happened, there was a lot of anxieties and it was, it was change and people, you know, probably resisted back then. But at the end of the day, it was the right thing to do. When we look at the trajectory, the trajectory of the city of St. Louis and, and, and as the mayor would say, reimagining public safety, I, I think this is an initiative that could be moving us in the right direction. But yet again, process is everything. So what, what I want to do is encourage the administration to um, work more closely with, with the Public Safety Committee, or at least the chairman of the Public Safety Committee, because at the end of the day, I mean, there are board bills and other things that we need to do to move this city forward. And right now, it seems to be a lot of tension. And what I would like to be able to do is offer a way to relieve some of that tension by encouraging um, people we have identified earlier, public safety director, the fire chief, the police chief. Uh, I would like to even hear from EMS workers themselves, you know, the, the dispatchers themselves uh, at, at a meeting soon uh, at the will of, of the chairman of this committee. Um, because I think if we do that collectively, you know, we're looking like, you know, we're all on one accord and we're serving the best interests of the city. Um, certainly, our egos can sometimes get in the way, uh, especially when we feel left out, um, because everybody has a role to play. Uh, we are all stakeholders at the end of the day. Um, the administration, the legislative branch, the judicial branch, we're all stakeholders, and we're all working and serving uh, the interests of citizens of this great city. So with that being said, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to offer this. Would you allow me to set up the next meeting um, with the stakeholders uh, that I propose to be at the next meeting? Yes, that would be okay. nice. The, the, the other thing, since we had someone from 73 here, maybe it'd be right to also ask someone from fire uh, to also give their opinion. On this. Okay. I, I'd like to see someone from fire here also. And, yes, uh, please set that up. Chairman Vaccaro, if, if I may, um, if uh, if we're going to hear from 73 and fire, uh, I, I think it would probably behoove us to hear from POA also, just to make sure that we get all of the stakeholders here and nobody is left out. So, okay, so let me say this. So let me say this. Anybody, because we're all in this together, anybody who wants to hear from a certain, who wants to ensure 
that certain representation is at the next 911 meeting, <laughs> please email me and say, hey, look, I like to hear from Richard Frank. I like to hear from whoever. And I will make sure I reach out to those individuals to see if we can secure their presence at the next meeting. Okay. I think that would be wonderful. All right. So you, you want me to move on with CSB? Or am I yeah, why, no, why right don't here? you go ahead? <clears throat> because okay. this, this was brought to us. Uh, all the women Howard had uh, brought this in one or two, and I really didn't have any questions. So I will let you just continue, and I'm going to. Sure. Just um, I also you. You know, wanted to have uh, CSB. Thank you, uh, Demetrius Alfred. I also wanted to have uh, CSB come. Um, we, we've had them before. They, they appear before the street committee. Um, but it still seems to be something lacking in the transmission of the service request. Uh, I had also asked if I saw Jamie Wilson here from the street department. I see Alan Jankowski, because I believe, and they needed to be here because streets and forestry are probably some of the, and, and traffic and refuse is, is, is some of the, the major calls that we get in the city for services. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to ask uh, Essence Owens, the director who, you know, I hope everybody else have, I have a very good working relationship where I think she's very responsive uh, whenever I call or email. Um, I know before she got there, people used to say at CSB, call you all of it. And, and, and that used to infuriate me because it, it made no sense that if you're calling CSB for services, that they should be telling you to call you all of it. So I would say I haven't heard that phrase in a long, long time. I hear it from the police more often now for some reason. People saying the police told me to call the alderman. So anyway, uh, I wanted her to share with us from the, uh, kind of give us a timeline of how this process worked from when a call is made to CSB and also talk about the, the, the extended wait time. So, because people are complaining about that, um, how it flows through the system, how it gets to the department, who um, closes it out, um, because there's confusion on it says abated, you know, but it's not abated in, in what all that means and how do we fix it? Because I don't think this is an essence Owens problem. I think it's just the system, the way it has been designed and there's just not enough communication. So essence, uh, I don't see her on my screen. Um, essence, are you there? I saw um, earlier. Or, 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 oh, there you are. Okay, I see you at the top of my screen. Okay, so walk us through that phone call uh, okay. and the average wait time that it takes, why it may take longer than usual, and then what happens once they actually get a hold of a live person. And also talk about the other ways that you can contact CSB because it's not just 622-4800. Go ahead, it's on you. Uh, so we do have uh, multiple mediums in which a citizen can contact CSB. So phone is one, email, voicemail, online chat, uh, and also Twitter, which is becoming increasingly uh, popular. Um, and our, currently our wait times are right about 10 to 15 minutes for a citizen to get through to the line. That's just a clear indication that I need more service reps. Right now I have six full-time people and two part-time people. So uh, I, I definitely would be pushing for more people this coming budget year. So for you that are on the budget committee, I will definitely be pushing for more CSRs and CSB. Um, but from the time that a caller comes into the system, uh, the first thing is for the CSB rep to ask where the location of the issue exists. The reason for that is because we want to check to make sure if someone else has already reported it or if it's a brand new issue. Uh, after that, the issue, um, if it's already been in the, in the system, what we will do is add the caller to that existing open service request um, and then provide the service request number and the date that the department will respond to our office. If the request is not in the system already, we will create a new service request um, geocoded and provide the date response to the system. Four, steps four, five, and six is kind of where it gets a little hazy. So step four is where it actually gets to the operating department when the inspector goes out and makes sure that there's indeed an issue that the city needs to address. Uh, step five 
If there are no services that are needing to be rendered, the city operating department will close out that service request and notate the service request with comments. Um, and that's often where some of the confusion comes in because if they close it out and say it's abated or were completed or no forestry violations or no violations period, that's where it gets frustrating for the citizen. Um, and then the last step of it, if the services are to be completed, the operating department will complete those services, notate the service request and uh, add the comments on there. And so go back to step five. Um, mm -hmm. when, when the confusion starts, when they say this, who's saying it's abated? So that would be the operating department. So per their inspection, they would go out and say, yes, there is a, a issue that needs to be addressed or no, there is no issue that needs to be addressed. And they notate that on the service request. CSB does not do that. Okay. All right. Um, so that's where the frustration comes in at when citizens call back into CSB and they want to know what's going on with the service request. Um, and I have one most recently that I can recall in my head from forestry where the caller was calling about weeds, high weeds and grass. The inspector went out and said that there were no forestry violations. Well, the lady continued to call in the next month and then the next month after that until she got to me. And what was happening was that the inspector closed out the request because there were no violations in the front of the property, but the rear of the property looked like Jermundi. So what happened is that I had to end up emailing Vicki and Allen and they clarified the, the situation and said that yes, all of the property is supposed to be cut the front and the rear, but the inspector closed out the service request prematurely and said that there were no forestry violations when indeed there were, they just were in the rear of the property and not the front. Gotcha. We're going to make this presentation a team effort. So I'm going to um, call on Alan Jankowski now. Um, so, Alan, sure. there you go. Yes. Oh, you know, I just I didn't see where you go. Or, do you have a, uh, your video on, Alan? I do now. There you go. Okay. I do better when I can see people. Um, so, oh, hi, Vicki. <laughs> so, Alan, when, how do you receive that message from CSB that you know, there was high grass and vegetation at X address? How do you receive that? How does it come into your office? So when I hear that, that definition right there, so that is a personnel issue. So that's our inspector not doing what they're supposed to do. So we talked to that inspector and said, hey, make sure not only respecting the front of the property, we have to inspect the back of the property. So that uh, and then we'd give it to our field crew to address. So our inspectors should be checking the front and the back of the property, and they know that. But 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 let me back up though, Alan. So when CSB sends over that complaint, how do you receive? Do you get it via email? Are you part of this central system? I mean, how does it enter into your office? It comes through City Works. To, City to our office, yes. And you have somebody that is sitting there checking City Works all day. Is it one person that receives that? Is it who, who takes care of that in your office? I'll let Vicki answer that one. She, okay. she deals with City Works all day long. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Alderman, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I have good four. Good, I have four <laughs> full-time customer service reps. Normally during the cutting season, I have four full-time and two per performance. I've not been able to hire two per performance. No one wants to work. Um, I have four clerks. They're all familiar with the process of service requests that come through the CSB. I have two individuals um, that look at the inbox every day, every morning, as well as I monitoring the system. When a weed complaint comes in, it can come in on different levels. Um, example, uh, a weed complaint comes in on a vacant building and we have a mapping system and we can see, oh, that is a vacant building that is on, that is already on our rotation. We would notate in the CSB on rotation, also we'll notate in the comments on scheduled rotation to be cut at or around a date, as you know. Our rotation schedule 
changes almost every day. And that is why it's on the Google sheet on the website. Um, when CSBs come through, uh, if the property is on rotation, we do not inspect them. They come through as an occupied, yes, we inspect. Or they come through and they are vacant, but they are not on the rotation. We will inspect and we have to send that property owner a notice of violation. And then we re-inspect within seven to 10 days. Um, any and all CSBs that come through, my mandate here is that my inspectors that only have three, mind you, only three, that we inspect and if a notice needs to be served, we mail that notice out within three days or four at the latest. So that's okay. just part of it. So it's just not one purpose. We all have, we're all collectively looking at the inbox. That's for any weed complaint be it you know occupied or vacant or vacant lot and are any tree concern and inspect city tree or inspect private tree so it's a it's a collective work team effort around here and as far as arborists i only have four arborists so i have four arborists and only three nuisance property inspectors so there's two sections yeah I, I hope. so vicky was initially talking about weed control and then the tree right. section has the yeah, arborist. But to go we, off we pride ourselves and, and we do have a process and protocol and how we respond on the service request. And yes, uh, it, it is a personal issue at time, which I call them out. And not only inspectors, but the field crew too, the field foreman, drive through that alley. You know, just don't do the front, you drive through the alley, get out, walk up that alley. The same with you know, um, any any type of inspection we're doing. Okay, well, let me ask this. So you said something that was really interesting, Vicki. You said if a, if a, if it comes in of high weeds and vegetation and it's already on your vacant right. property or whatever list, you right. don't take any action because you're just going to wait until the, that 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 rotation comes around. Right now, we will take action if it comes in as a missed cut or unsatisfied cut because we do keep our rotation sheets per ward. And as you know, Alderman Jeffrey Boyd, we cut by cycle, by ward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now I just wanna be clear about process. I, mm -hmm. I know it's, it's, it's schizophrenic on how we're trying to maintain all this overgrown grass. So CSB sends you a request of high weeds and vegetation. It's you see it's on your vacant property list. Somebody has to provide action. CSB is gonna, well, Essa said, hey, we're gonna do this and we're gonna say the, the, the department is gonna have it done in 30 days. And I don't know where, I'll come back to you, Essa, I don't know where you, where do you get those days from, uh, those the date to be completed from. But when it comes to forestry on this particular example, somebody has to notate either, you know, some action. I mean, if a constituent calls in and we know the rotation is not going to happen for another two months, at least we have to tell the constituent, hey, we can't be back there until October the 9th. And I, and I do that on the, S, on, the, um, on the service request. We notate on, we put at public, on schedule rotation, at our round, and the date. Okay. So we're, we're given the citizen also, also that same information is provided on the assessor's website. When you put in an address, mm -hmm. as you scroll down, it will tell you whether or not that property is on the cutting schedule and the last date that property was cut. Okay. And when it's a private, you said if it's a private owned um, piece of property, the inspector goes out there within three days or, or they're Thank notified. You. Say that again. If it's occupied or if it's a new, a new parcel that has come to our attention. Oh, okay. There's a lot um, of private properties on our rotation. Yeah, there's a lot of yeah. private properties. Yeah, I, I'm gonna I don't, I'm gonna put you on the spot, and I'm not being disrespectful because you know you guys are one of my favorite departments, but I know I put a complaint in on thirteen. 13, 15 through 23, hold them on. And 
and I don't see in here, Vicky, where you're saying it can show where the uh, service request was put in, or maybe I'm not looking under the right category. No, not the service request, whether that property is on forestry's cut schedule. Oh, okay. All right, well, offline, I want to talk to you about that particular address. Okay. Um, so, street department, same questions, Jamie. So, when do you guys get it through City Works as well? Oh, you switched up on me. That looks like Kent Flake. That ain't Jamie. Yeah, Hello? he's 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 currently in a BPS meeting. He's wrapping up right now. So, okay, I'll in a moment. Okay, so. So do the requests come into you via City Works as well, Kent? Yep, absolutely. They're one hundred percent electronic. Okay, and who's responsible for, you know, doing the follow up, saying it will be completed by date or it has been completed? Whose responsibility is that in the street department? Uh, it depends on which portion of our our operation it is. So, all of our street and traffic inspectors. Uh, they have a manager, and it's all handled electronically on their tablets. Uh, it doesn't usually get brought to anybody's attention until it would happen to go overdue. Uh, our 510, our street director's office. That's a lot more. Okay, all the women. Oh, I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so go ahead, Kent. But, but typically our street director's office or uh, department 510 we don't have too many issues with that uh as far as overdues unless it is a like sewer lateral uh which does get strung out for a long time depending on if it's emergency mm -hmm. or not uh, but that's very different than most of the rest of our inspections on that side uh 511 which is traffic uh they come in or the request comes in go straight to dispatcher and especially if it's during the day will automatically get dispatched to a crew for the light out, the knockdown pole, the street sign that's been knocked over, whatever it might happen to be. Uh, 511 or traffic division, I actually just looked at theirs this morning. I think they have two that are overdue uh, that are not pending. Uh, with them, most of their stuff that is pending is your decorative slash historical uh, lights out there uh, that are typically on back order for a long time because they're just hard to get. Uh, I can't speak about refuse too much. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what their numbers look like, but street maintenance, uh, those come in electronically. We print those. We actually print those out and hand them to crews if we have crews. Uh, currently, I think most of you know that we have very, very limited patch crews uh, after a couple of committee meetings. Well, we actually print those. Uh, we actually have somebody route those out. So whenever we do go out, we'll be the most efficient that we can be. Uh, the reason we print those, we don't do tablets or anything like that, is uh, if you deal with asphalt, you deal with tar, uh, a tablet's not going to last very long. And uh, it's just a lot easier to give them a piece of paper, have them uh, either write complete, not complete. If it's a utility cut, they write three by five utility cut, patched. Uh, then they turn those back in at the end of the day, and uh, either myself or our superintendent go ahead and close those out at the end of the day. Uh, okay, so you so you're closing them out in City Works, and so CSB can see everybody can see that it's completed. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, I have to back up and do some housekeeping. I apologize for this, but can't explain to tell everybody, you know, again who you are, what you do for the city. <laughs> Yep, I'm Kent Flake, uh, Commissioner of Streets. And uh, typically my duties are city tow, uh, the street and traffic inspectors, and street maintenance. Okay. And uh, Alan, uh, tell us again who you are, what you do for the city. My name's Alan Jankowski. I'm Commissioner of Forestry. Forestry deals with vacant weeds, or deals with uh, properties. We cut weeds throughout the city. And then we also deal with trees on, on the uh, street trees and, and park trees as well. And Vicki Wakeland. Hi there, I'm Alan's executive assistant too. I'm his sidekick. 
and I manage the process that comes through from the CSB and the uh, protocol and the procedures I put in place here to get it out to the field crews. Okay, in essence, just for the record. I'm the, <laughs> I'm Essence Owens, I'm the Neighborhood Development Executive for the City of St. Louis and I oversee the Citizen Service Bureau and also the Neighborhood Improvement Specialist. Okay, follow up question to you, Essence. Where do you get this projected completion date from? So I want to correct you just a little bit. It's not completion date, it's department response date. So that came about four years ago when I went to each operating department and them and their business with them. So it was all of the commissioners of streets, forestry, refuse, and went and sat out with them and walked through everything. So they said that in about three days, we could have an inspection done or within 14 days, we can have an inspection done. For most service requests in the CSB, the inspection date is 14 days. Okay. All right. Now I, I'm going to go around and ask my committee members if they would like to be even more informed. Okay, we're gonna start with all the woman Davis. Is she still with us? Okay, we'll okay. go to. Are you there? All the woman Davis. Okay, I'm moving on. All the woman Howard. Yes, I appreciate all, all your time today, everyone. Um, I don't really have any questions. I think I've um, had most of my things addressed. Um, so there's no questions for me. Thank you very much. Okay, Alderman Davis, I see you now. I'm gonna come back to you. I really don't have any questions. Um, I get good service uh, from the supervisor and uh, the person working my ward, so I'm good. Okay, Autumn Spencer. Autumn Pam Boyd. Oh, I have no questions. I'm complimenting everybody that's on the line. Hi, Ken. Hi, Alan. And uh, I have no problems with any of the people that I work with because I get a good response. Even though we're in this pandemic and Alan is up to his head in grass, but we're okay. All righty. Uh, Alderman Bosley. Alderman Bosley. Moving on. Alderman Muhammad. Okay, Alderman Muhammad. Moving on. Alderman Oldenburg. Alderman Oldenburg. Alderman Orion. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I uh, just want to take a, a quick second uh, and thank the folks from Forestry and from Streets. I know Streets is dealing with an issue for me as, as we speak, <laughs> so I'm uh, uh, thrilled about that. Um, and also just wanted to take a, a moment to uh, to brag about my NIS, who is doing an incredible job. Um, so I don't want uh, anyone to think that my, my question has anything to do with their performance. I think you guys are all crushing it. Um, so is there any way for aldermen to get access to city works? Because we take in questions and complaints about uh, various issues I think many of my colleagues could tell you that really all hours of the day and night we're, we're hearing uh, various issues. And I hate to um, uh, have that additional step on every, every question that someone asks regarding, hey, what's the status of this, uh, this specific uh, request for service? Uh, is there any way for us as aldermen to, to, to view when those uh, uh, response dates are to put anything into uh, city works um so actually you all can check the the status online at the city's website you can go and enter uh the service request id or... sure sure yeah just on on the website but within city works itself is there any way yeah you you can have uh read only rights we've had all the people uh, requested that before Okay, great. And so, what, what would what would uh, what would that process be? Just to would it just be email you and ask? 
Uh, you can, but CityWorks uh, would actually handle that request. So CityWorks at stlewis-mo.gov. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. That's all I have. And keep up the great work. Thank you. Okay, all on the clock, Hubbard. No questions. Just thank you for everybody for your continued service on um, helping okay. the this pandemic. All right, all my page is gone. Uh, oh, oh, the chairman, Vaccaro. Just quickly, uh, not even so much. And, and I'm sorry, because I had a phone call in the middle of this, so I, I, I didn't hear the first part. So, um, so and, and I share the same NSO with the alderman from the 24th, which she's wonderful. So I, you know, I called about an alley that needed to be paid. I sent it, and I guess, Kent, you're aware of that this morning or yesterday. And the first question I get is, well, why didn't they call CSP? Which I included Karen in the email. And Karen sends back a thing, no on 710, and she sent me the number that she did call, C you know, she put a CSP complaint in for me. And, you know, and this was back on 710. And, you know, the people who were on me this morning, or, or day before yesterday, want to know why nothing's being done. And I, if, if I remember, it seems like, well, maybe they should have turned something into CSP. And actually they did. And actually we have a CSP number. So I guess my thing is, I mean, CSP did their job, my NSO did their job. You know, I guess mine is just more to Kent or Jamie why wouldn't you guys have had at least said, oh yeah, Joe, we have the CSB complaint number. We're just shorthanded right now, but we have a plan to get to it. I'm just curious, do you guys not get access to all these? Like when I send an address or she sends an address, is that something you don't have access to that you don't know it's been sent in already, even though it's been quite a while ago? Well, I have pretty much access to everything there is for the most part. It could be related to us. Uh, I believe our superintendent is the one that originally answered that. And, and he only has access to what goes to 514, which is street maintenance. And it started off as a 510 issue because it was a sewer lateral. So two different departments on that one. Or two different divisions within the department. Okay, because I sent the, I mean, actually she sent the pictures again. So now it's on the list to be patched back, I guess. But so so is that CSB's fault then for not sending it to the right department? Is it I'm something trying that they, that, I'm trying to find that exact one, but like I said, it came in originally as a sewer lateral. We did a sewer lateral repair there. My guys actually created a work order that went or my 510 street director's office inspectors created a work order that went to street maintenance my superintendent of the street maintenance did not find that or see it because it's actually under 510 and the piece of paper is actually sitting over in my patch guy's inbox and honestly we're probably 3,500 4,000 patches behind since we've got one to two people patching on any given day uh, so this doesn't I, look like, I mean, I, I, so I just pulled it up again right now. Um, this doesn't look like sewer lateral. It looks like just. Um, what, can I the, the service request number, Alderman Vaccaro? This is, well, you know what, you're probably right, Ken, because last winter a pipe busted and, and had been repaired and the asphalt has yet to been fit. You're right. Kent's on the right. So it's, oh. without getting in a specific house, it's in about the 6,000 block of uh, the Lowe's. And so this goes back, you're, in, in, in Kent, you're right. It started out as a sewer lateral uh, and okay. they put in a CSB request and that goes way back in the day. And then, and then the, um, um, you know, Karen put in, uh, a CSB report again on 710. And yet when, when, when we sent this, the question was, well, they need to go through CSB, which they did twice. 
I mean, I'm just curious, is that someone that falls on who, who's, you know, how did, you know, I guess, and this goes back over a year now that, you know, we, we did the sewer work. We just never put back, you know, and they put the concrete and you get them with the big dip. Um, is it, is it that the, the, the sewer lateral to the people that did the sewer work, are they not telling you that they finished the job or it's been a little over a year? First of all, that was a water department job okay. and water department city works and street and the rest of the city city works is a little different. And I'm not going to try to explain that today uh, because water department had first essence can probably explain this better than I can. Uh, they are somewhat related, but they're not related. I don't believe. I mean, the, the water department is a city office, right? I mean, the city workers, right? Yes, they are, but they they opted to do a different version of City Works than all of the other operating agencies. So they're the only ones who have that different City Works version. But everything that we send over to everyone else, we can all see the same thing. So when you're sending something, then essence, you're sending it to CSB, but the water department's not even getting it. Well, is, we're is not that my understanding. So no, we're not, we send it to water and they can see it when it comes from us, but the communication between maybe the street department and the water department is where it gets a little fuzzy. If one division has to pick up the work. So like in in instance, they had to do the work first, but then the water department had to finish it up or vice versa. So that gets a little hazy. So, so the, Kent, are they not communicating with you? I mean, there's some, do we need to? Talk this to is, them over there. This, this is very easy uh, after finding the email chain here. Uh, last winter, per the email, a water pipe burst right. and had to be repaired. Uh, at some, we were never contacted until July, uh, July 10th. Right, July 10th. That's when uh, Karen, and I Karen Clifford sent that. put it into our system. And needless to say, we are definitely two months behind on. No, I, I no, I understand that. I'm not criticizing that. I understand and, that. And it should have actually been brought to grade because I've told all contractors to bring it to grade. So, it it and, and I'm not I'm I wasn't criticizing. I'm trying to learn just a quick, you know, because they you're right. Multiple CSP complaints. If you follow the chain, were put in. Water did it, and then I guess you guys were not told about it until. Karen went out there and took a picture because the person was complaining to us. Yep. Karen's our, our neighbor improvement specialist. She sent something in on 710. And then, of course, they're sending her and me both a letter going, gee, you know, now how many tires do we have to ruin, you know, uh, before this is ever going to get fixed? And then I sent you something again, I guess, yesterday. And then when we sent it, I think if you look at the chain, one of the things was, did the, the asking the person, did you put a CSP complaint in? And then Karen stepped in and said, yes, we did on 710. So, I mean, it just, it just makes, you know, it makes me as an all of them look bad. It makes us look like we don't know what we're doing. And I mean, we don't, because we don't get, I mean, I, I get the emails, but anyway, I'm going to leave, leave it at that, but I, I it, it does seem like there's a, a big disconnect in between the water in the streets. And, and I guess now I'd like to get Kurt Scobie and them in to ask why have you opted to do a different CSB report? You know, you know, why do they why are they special? And why are they doing something different, which only adds another step to something, making it more difficult. Anyway, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. I'll I'll just kind of mute myself. Okay, we're gonna go back to Alderman Brandon Bosley. All right, <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate CSB and all the directors on. Uh, one of the things I did want to do is make a comment. I recently have had um, experience sharing the, uh, um, well, not even just an experience, I've had a conversation with the CSB director um, and you, uh, have taken some changes, uh, made some changes there in the office, which I
thing weren't happening before. I'm gonna we got we're there. Uh, we'll be taking pictures in front um, uh, departments work that's requested by the resident. Can you hear me now? We missed the whole. Am month. I still breaking up? You you said something about the changes that CSD made, and we didn't hear too much after the changes. Are you still there? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, sir. Can you hear me now? My my internet and stuff sometimes isn't very good in here. I, I, that's why I walk around a lot when you see me on camera. Maybe, is that better? Okay. Okay, well, the, the, the signal that's picks up all over the place. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so what I was saying, so I just recently spoke with uh, the CSB director and uh, I appreciate you, Ms. Owens, um, about one of the changes that was made uh, here since you've been the director. Were you all taking photos of the, the, the service request prior to you being there and leaving some evidence behind so we could go back and research what was being done? No, so prior to that, they weren't taking any pictures at all, but we know that pictures are worth a thousand words. And so it also helps to for the operating departments to know that problems still do exist. Uh, and just like Alderman Vicaro said, his NIS did kind of took a picture and say, hey, this problem is still here. What are we going to do about it? So that was one thing that I have gotten accomplished since being here. Thank you. Is, is, now, is that a request or something that all departments are asked to do or something that they just, um, you know, some can do or some don't do? So that was an ask of all of the operating departments, uh, but some are not able to do it because of budgetary reasons or what have you. Uh, and then like Kent said, you know, working with the asphalt, it's a little bit, <laughs> it's a little difficult to do. Um, but yeah, that was an ask of all the operating departments. Okay, appreciate that. And as far as the budgetary problems uh, with I guess some of those departments that couldn't, is that can you give me an idea of what that budgetary issue may be? Just because it'd be good for us to know, particularly because some departments are doing that. That is, I think, a major change um, because a lot of times the departments are saying it's CSB. You know, you can go back and see that your job is to record information and ensure that a resident has a ticket number to go by when something or a service was requested. That's your job. And if that's being done and there are service requests and you know, departments are saying they went out and inspected something or they've done a particular action, it would make sense for that to be documented, especially in 2020 with some type of video or photography. Um, yeah. What would be the hold up that one department may be experiencing budgetarily? Or with the budget in I, particular? I think the problem is that they don't have the money to purchase the tablets. So, uh, and then the, the mobile hotspots and things of that nature that they may need. So that may be uh, part of the problem for them. Okay. Well, and that's, once again, I, I appreciate that. I think that was a major upgrade there for our eyes and especially for the residents who normally uh, get these ticket numbers and feel like there have been weeks and weeks and there hasn't been anything being done or they see these piles of trash being picked up. I mean, we're not being picked up and they think they're the same pile that was there a month ago. And, you know, they're different. It may be the same items um, because people frequently dump in the same spots where they can get away with it. And mm -hmm. you got contractors who go clean out buildings and they go clean out another. It could be still a couch and a TV, but it's a different color couch, you know, in a TV. So, um, you know, once again, I, I appreciate the work that you are doing. I think that it's important for us to highlight uh, when we have offices that are working towards upgrading the offices and the prior issues and the communication um, between departments. And, and, you know, you've actually, have, once again, done something significant there um, that can give us a track record on what's going on in particular between those departments and the CSB offices for, for us communication. Um, so I want to point that out to you know, some of all the people on the call who may be on also ways and means that we may need to look into maybe giving uh, you know, a few extra dollars here, uh, maybe with these ARPA funds or other funds to help these departments get what they need. So there can be evidence, particularly between service requests and what is being done for every department. That's something that we can keep a record of long term. It helps us as all the people be able to articulate to our residents that something did happen. Here's a step-by-step -step, um, 
uh, once again, picture of it, our documentation of what we did. We're not just telling you we went out there, but we can show you. Remember that couch? It doesn't, you know, remember that was green. This one is black now. So something something changed from the last two weeks. Uh, and so it's very, very, very significant part of the changes in that office. And just one more question. Was the system changed at all uh, since you've been in office? Was that option there prior to you becoming the director? Uh, so prior to me becoming a director, we didn't have the at public where the comments were made public. Uh, we didn't have cameras or anything like that. So we done a lot to try to be transparent in the office and let citizens know what's actually happening with the service request as it progresses through the system. Understood. Um, <clears throat> uh, I've also heard some residents say that they cannot make multiple um, or get multiple service request numbers at one time. Can you give any insight to that or maybe mm -hmm. let them know the best way um, to uh, get two service request number at some time. Sometimes it could be a tree and then you also got a pile of debris that needs to be picked up. That's a, you know, few meters down from the tree or just, you know, it's just not necessarily the tree that they want to request. Can you clarify that a little bit more? I try to direct my residents to look at videos and kind of look at what we're doing so they can really get a in-depth understanding of, you know, what's really happening. So if the service request is different, so if they want to report the tree, that's messed up or a pothole at the same address, they can do that. So where the problem comes in at is that a lot of residents will try, like if everybody on one block decides that they all want to report this one pothole, well, if they all put in the same address, then the system will not allow that if it's already open because we don't want to send multiple requests to the operating department. They already know that the one exists. So what we will do is add those additional callers to that open request. Now, if the service request is closed, then we will open it back up with a new ticket. Mm -hmm. But if it's already open, we don't want to send duplicate requests over to the operating departments. Completely understand. And, and when there is a, let's say a service request closed by one of the departments and uh, you know, resident calls back and say, hey, this, this hasn't been um, mm -hmm. addressed and a department says that it, that it has been addressed um, what would you say is your function as, as the office at that particular point? Do you make a new service request number? Do you all reach out to that department and, you know, ask them uh, any Just questions? Create. Yeah, so what we would do is create a new service request for that. Um, and, and most often nobody has an issue with it. If okay. it's been closed. If it's been closed. Um, but from your experience, when that does happen and you go back to the departments, what is that communication like? Um, is the department usually, um, well, I guess, and this is just like, we all have to have conversations so we can better the process. So I'm not playing the blame game or anything like that, but it's all, but it's good for us to know specifically where your line in the sand stops and where the departments actually pick that up so we can know how to move forward and have better communication between departments and, and the services that our residents need. But um, from the time that CSB looks like you just went black, am I tripping? Yeah, I did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Didn't move enough. <laughs> uh, all right. So from the time that that does happen and a resident calls back and requests the new service number, um, what is the communication between CSB and the department? Are you know are you supposed to call them and um, uh, let them know that that wasn't done, or do you just open up a new service request and send it to them? Is you know how how does that work out in particular so they don't have those form and look at that same request that they think they may have went out and handled, but the resident is saying that hey you didn't, you may as a foreman thought you did it that day, or maybe you did something that was down the road. Maybe you did half of that service request, um, but you didn't do the other half. And the resident was expecting, once again, the tree to be trimmed and the, the grass to be cut that day or the trash to be picked up because they called and got two service request number and just one was closed or, I mean, or, or both of them was closed from the department ends. You know, what exactly do you all do from that? Um, that point? So the service rep would actually send an email to the person who closes in the operating department. Everybody has an email address inside of CityWorks. So what we can do is do the at their last name and first initial, 
And then what we can do is put a comment behind it. So for a forestry one, we may say, like the one that I was speaking about earlier on uh, Bayard, what we did was we asked Vicky was that the caller stated that it was still a problem uh, in the rear of the location and service was needed, but forestry closed it out saying that there were no forestry violations. So from that, then Vicky and I started communicating. But before then, it was the CSB team with the forestry uh, CSR team. And they couldn't somehow get it together until I got involved and then I got Vicky and Alan involved. That's when it got rectified. But the communication should have been much better. And it, obviously, it should have been done before Alan and Vicky got involved. Understood. So, so I appreciate that. Definitely appreciate you and the services that you render. I know it's very difficult being the pretty much the communication liaison between all departments and all residents when there is a request for service in the city. Um, but I do think beyond a shadow of a doubt that you've made some significant changes there in that office. And if we continue in that direction, you continue to do what it is that you're doing there. Um, you know, and we continue to do what we can to, to build these lines of communication and make them a little better and supply these different departments with the tools they need also to help communicate back better. Uh, you know, then we should, we should definitely uh, push ourselves into a, a different place here in the future and be forward looking. And it's not going to stop the dumping, but, you know, it, it definitely gets us to a place where we're picking it up a little bit more quickly or bare minimum documenting, um, the, the communication lines of when it is that it's requested, what exactly necessarily was picked up, because we got, once again, some digital copies of these things and some evidence of what it is we're doing out there so we can show that to our residents who may feel underserved. So um, once again, I appreciate it. Um, is there, I just, once again, for the record, is there any other changes that you made in the office you might wanna, wanna put out there while, um, you know, while we have you? We don't. Uh I always just have the, all of you in these departments on the line at the same time. Uh, just the other one of having the NIS is a more service request. Uh, they were, before I became director, they were only following up on the request that they entered, which as a group is about 25,000 service requests a year. And so they were totally missing out on the service request that CSB was entering, which is about 75,000 a year. So I actually have them to follow up on everything in their ward now versus what they were just doing before, just following up on only their service request. Oh, that's, that is great. So they follow up on every service request that they get, not in even the side in the ward period, regardless of who puts it in. Yep. That is that 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 is great. So we go from what twenty five thousand follow ups to seventy five thousand in per year. That is that's great, great upgrade. I appreciate that. Um, is. Okay, well, you know what, that, that'll be all my question. I, I know I talk a lot, but this is important. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity <laughs> to, to speak with everyone. And I definitely, once again, appreciate everybody's service. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield. Thank you, Alderman Bosley. Um, I, 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 I like to do a smile. I can't talk about anybody talking long, so I'm cool <laughs> with it. Um, uh, Alderman Evans, you have your hand up or? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and all the departments uh, involved. Also, Ms. Essence, Allen, Vicki. Where is Vicki? We said we need to meet each other in person, but th it's still coming. <laughs> <laughs> and Jamie and Kent. Uh, I am aware of all of these individuals. I have talked to them or emailed them either through my secretary, <laughs> because I have a lot of concerns in my ward, which is ward four. Um, forestry. Um, I think I have the most vacant weeded lots in the city of St. Louis. I may be wrong. Uh, <laughs> Not you, Jeffrey. Uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> so I, my constituents, they call me and then I call you guys. And um, I, I know that you guys handle them as best you can. Uh, sometimes uh, I, 
I'll be out and I'll see the grass cutters and they may be either driving through my ward or whatever. And I hail them, I say, hey, are you guys coming into my, are you coming to this address or to this lot or whatever? And a lot of times they'll say, well, we're working on a work order. I said, well, can I see that work order? Uh, just kidding. But I say, well, can you hit such and such an address? And they'll say, uh, what, what street is that? And a lot of times they'll do it, which is great. And I hope I'm not getting anybody in trouble, but they'll, they'll do it. So um, my, my concern is that the cuts are far and few between. And I know there's a, a set uh, time that you guys cut, you say, well, um, we, we cut, what is it? Two or three times a year, correct me if I'm wrong. Two or three times. Yeah, it just depends on how many staff, we, how many staff we have. Like okay. this year, we, this year we did one rotation on big buildings. Two years ago, we did three, almost four. So it really depends on that labor that we have out there. So um, makes a big difference. Okay, yeah, because my constituents call and say, well, my grass grows every week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or this grass grows every week and it's not on a, on a rotation. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just throwing that out there because mm -hmm. we all are shooting for the same thing. And that is to make our wards and communities look good. Uh, when I drive through there and I see a lot of the stuff that needs to be cut, it's very disheartening, but can't give up because the constituents are counting on us to do the things that need to be done. Refuge, is anyone here from Refuge? Can't can speak to Refuge. Okay, where is Or Karen? Jamie. Jamie's there. Hi, Welcome Jamie. back, Jamie. Oh, okay. this, tablet, this tablet just spun itself around. <laughs> okay, <laughs> refuse. Um, there's a lot of dumping in my ward in the alleys, especially uh, on the alleys of the 44 through 4600 of Elm Bank in Ashland and Elm Bank and Greer their mattresses and where I'm hoping that they get picked up soon. I'm hoping, hoping. So all the women have, have they been picked up? Because we just did a cleanup over there on Thursday of last you week. You did? Yes, ma'am. Well, I tell you what, if and they were picked up, I, I, I apologize. As soon as I get off of here, I'm going to drive down there and check and see. And okay. if they're not, I'll be calling again, okay? But I'm <laughs> praying that they were picked up and I appreciate that. I appreciate all you guys. Um, uh, I've got one more thing, you know, with forestry. I had uh, constituents calling me in about a private uh, owner whose grass was taller than me almost and I'm five feet three. No, five foot two and a half. I cheat on five foot three. Okay. But the thing of it is, all, okay. all summer long, we have to look at and put up with the weeds. Yeah. Then the day that the contractors, you guys, are coming out to cut it, he gets there ahead of them. And he does a botched up job. And I'm just saying, is someone letting him know ahead of time? Or do you guys notify people before the cutters go out? If it's you not let on the our people road. Know. Yeah, we have to send them a letter indicating that we can come on their property. So we do notify them that the okay. grass is violation. But do you violation. let them know the exact date? No. No. I can't hear you, Alan. 
No, we don't give them an exact date. Do you let them know the exact date? No. Because, okay, because now all summer long, the grass has not been cut. But then the day that the cutters get there, he's in the back cutting it with a weed whacker. And the front, he cuts with a weed whacker. And I'm yeah. saying, well, do you have a lawnmower? Uh, this is as good as it's going to get. I'm not using a lawnmower. I say, well, I have a lawnmower. I'll let you use mine. Because we want his land, his house, to fit in with the rest of the block. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, no, nope, I'm not doing it. And so I talked with the guys from your department they came out to do the cutting. They say, well, ma'am, we can't cut because he's out here. But he does a piss poor job. He whacks it with the weed whacker and then he blows it up. He doesn't pick it up. He blows it up on the grass. So it's looked like a stack of hay instead of uh, grass being cut. And I told him, I said, you know what? The property is vacant. I said, I bet where you live, the grass does not look like this. And he didn't say anything. But the thing of it is, you need to treat your property, whether it's vacant or occupied, like you live in it. And we have to sit here and look at this mess and the people that came from the city would have done a heck of a lot better job than what he did. But needless to say, it still sits there. And the address is 4520 Elm Bank. Okay. All right, I'm gonna take a look at it. I appreciate that. On rotation. Okay. And uh, I'm gonna wrap it up. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Streets, street department. Uh, if you call in potholes, how much of a turnaround time would you say would take place for the potholes to be filled? Is that Kent? That's back to Kent, yep. <laughs> uh, at this point, it is a long time. Uh, <sighs> we prioritize them based on if we're getting property damage claims or if they're in the middle of Kings Highway versus if they're on a residential street. But uh, since we started our paving program back in April or May, I have literally had one to two guys patching potholes per day. It's one to two okay. people, not one to two crews. Okay. Uh, since we started paving back in late April, early May. Well, I'm on your paving list as well. But I'm just talking about the little potholes. Yep. Same. Yep. It's it's a long time. We're, we probably have, I haven't looked lately, but probably three to 3,500 or 3,000 to 3,500 potholes behind at this point. You, okay. You're about okay. I've got one more concern. And this is from a constituent that lives at 4429 Greer. She says, whenever it rains, it floods up on the sidewalk in front of her house to the point where she has to get out of her car and walk around to walk to get to her house. So I said, well, that sounds like that might be an MSD problem. She says, I said, where is your sewer intake? Mm -hmm. It's a long block from Taylor to uh, uh, Newstead and it's an intake on each end of that block. Which, and I'm just saying, that's horrible. You know, where does the water run in, in the middle of the street? So I'm just throwing that out there. I don't know who can help uh, solve or resolve her problem, but Every time I see her, she's saying the same thing. She's singing the same story. 
So that's at 4429 Greer. And uh, her name is Laura Sanders. And um, she would just like to have that fixed on her block. She says her street strength slants down toward her curve, her, her sidewalk, and all the water just gathers there. I'm just saying. I know you guys can help us work this out. And I love you guys. I love everybody, all of you guys, because I know you're also doing your best to help make St. Louis become a better place. And I think that's it. I'm looking on my, on my sheet. Yeah, I okay. think that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to get ready to wrap this up. I got one last thing I want to ask about process uh, with Kent and um, Alan. So one of the, the best things you guys could have done when it came to debris uh, was forestry working with the street department on, you know, doing all, doing all that bulk pickup stuff for debris. But there's a one little hiccup. So when the, the crew go out and they weed whack down hills and all that stuff, they rake all that stuff in the street. And it just sits there for months. And how does that work? I mean, who's not telling who what? Is there a, a, a work order that force we need to put into the system so that street knows to come by and pick it up? Or what, what's going on with that? Uh, no, we ain't doing no work on this. Yeah, so at Forestry cuts the lot and then we send it over to the street department. So whether every property gets on there, I'm not sure. We could debate that all day long here. Um, but that's the process that takes place. When you how do you send it over to the street department? Hello. There is a specific debris farm that each foreman has. We control foreman has. They put the location ward if the debris is in the front or rear. And every morning they're in my inbox and I immediately scan them to Willie Young. And that's what we've been doing for, I don't know, Kent, almost three years now. Yeah. Three years. Yeah. And, oh. it's, it's, and, that's, and it's been working fine. I mean, Willie has always appreciated that. And I break it up into wards for him. Well, Willie Young is awesome. I mean, if, if I ever need to interact with him, the problem gets solved almost immediately. But I don't want to have to send him an email. I want the system to work. So Kent, where are you not doing what you're supposed to do so that Willie can get this done? It's your fault. <laughs> no, as far as I know, if we receive a property, we're picking it up within two or three days at most. We just have to receive the, the property. Okay. I want you to look at uh, 1600 block of Union. So just, I'm not going to give you an address, but see if you got any work orders for Union Boulevard. It happens every year. It just sits there for at least a month. It, it's amazing how these two particular properties or whatever, every year is the same thing. And again, Willie Young does a phenomenal job. He gets five stars from me. You know, I, I have nothing. <laughs> You know, but good stuff to say about him. But there is a hiccup in the system somewhere, especially on Union, because um, that seems to be where most of the headache is. And every now and then it happens on uh, the interior residential streets. Union is a, pretty much a commercial street. Maybe that's the problem. I don't know. But um, we need to figure out, you know, why that keeps happening, Kent. And can you let me know when you figure it out so we know we got it fixed? Oh, God. Yeah, Kent. Yes, absolutely. I'll probably have an okay. answer here in the next two minutes. All righty. Uh, you don't have to because I need to wrap this up. We've been at this a long time. <laughs> I think it's time for some people to go home. And then we taking Alan and Vicky away from all that stuff that they get done on a daily basis. See, they not feel this work on a request that so they hear with us. <laughs> so I think that's pretty much going to wrap us up. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to turn this back over to you. Thank you. Uh, just as a quick reminder, uh, the vice chairman is going to set up a meeting. Uh, I, I would ask also include uh, the uh, ethic, 
ethical society police as well as 73 as well as fire and whoever else she could think of and plan on an early long meeting next tuesday <clears throat> uh, i'm hoping to revisit the uh, plumbing and pipe fitter bill which uh alderman tyus is sponsoring now uh, i'm also a co-sponsor so we're going to revisit that because the plumbers and pipe fitters are still on uh, a 2009 code when the rest of everybody's at 15 working on 23. So uh, hopefully we're gonna get into that next next Tuesday. Uh, one of the other things that I wanna address at some point is where we're at with the homeless people and the money that, um, you know, is it, supposed to be going to help uh, my understanding, you know, even like that $500 thing, they haven't even gone as far as getting back the RSP. You know, people ask me, well, how do I get that $500? They haven't even put the structure together on how to get that out. Or if they have, it's again, a mystery to me. I, I wish they would communicate better with us so that I can quit criticizing them. But when I don't have the answers and, and I can't get answers, Although I do think I got the answer to that. It'll be somewhere after the first of the year, even though they were saying the Alder, you know, the Board of Aldermen uh, is delaying getting the money out. We passed this quite a while back. So I, those are a couple of things that I want to get to the bottom of. Uh, you know, So there might be some uh, ne next Tuesday, I want to do that. But, but I would say, Vice Chairman, if you would, you could set a meeting up for any, you know, anytime you want. I just kind of keep that in mind, if you would, that I'd like to get that. Uh, you know, I want to bring in someone from the Flutters and Pipe Fitters and someone from the building division, uh, you know, because we can't just not ever pass a code. In other words, you know, you know, while the rest of the world will be on the 2021 codes, the city will still be on the 09 codes, you know, we have to get past that impasse and maybe they need to work together. But anyway, that, that's just planned. So other than that, I, I will uh, take a motion to adjourn unless somebody- oh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, real quick, I just thought of something. Let me ask Kent Flake another question. I'm Sure. Kent, you, you brought up something that about the potholes. I remember when potholes was like two day turnaround. Yeah. And so obviously we're shorthanded, but we have the citywide contract that do speed humps. Couldn't they fill potholes too? They probably could for a price. Well, why don't we work on that? I mean, just to me, we have a we're gonna have a millions and millions of dollars left over in the personnel line item at the end of the year because we can't find people. So we're gonna have to start contracting some stuff out. We cannot continue to allow our citizens to just go underserved because people don't want jobs today, which crime should definitely be way down since there's so many jobs out here. Can we look into that or maybe it's a Jamie thing? No, we can, we can certainly talk about it here and we can speak with it with BPS and the mayor's office. Yeah, I mean, we have to think, you know, a little differently than the traditional way of doing stuff. Cause I mean, time is of the essence on grass cutting, potholes being filled, you know, the speed humps, I mean, you guys are behind quite a bit. It's not your fault. It's just, it's hard to find good workers. And I certainly understand that. But I want to encourage us to, you know, you know, look at trying to hire outside contractors to help us out until we get back on our feet. So it's just, a, it's a suggestion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, that, that made me think of a question. Mr. Wait, Chairman. Wait. Uh, oh, yes. Go ahead. Uh, may I? Oh, yes, please. Okay. I, I mean, I'm all for getting the job done, but at the same time, I think we, we really need, and I know this isn't in public safety, we need to look at trying to pay our people fairly and getting people enlisted that will work for, uh, you know, more than the minimum wage for, you know, some of these jobs. It's hard work. Um, and, and that's part of the reason. And then the other reason is we're confined to people that live in the city uh, for our workforce. So I think we need to and, the, and I agree with Alderman Boyd as far as outsourcing. Yes, we do need our citizens don't need to be without services. It's, it's pathetic the way I, we go through the city 
And I think right now we've got a contract out to cut trees down again. And um, if we can get the dead trees down, that would improve our perspective a whole lot. Thank you so much. I'm sorry to keep you any longer. I have a, a, a 10 second question. Kent, um, I know you put all the sidewalk work on hold and you haven't, I got, have, have we got another sidewalk contractor yet? We oh, have, uh, we have two change orders on existing contracts that are going to be coming into fruition very shortly. Uh, I have not submitted capital money to BPS in order to start building probably two more contracts. So I was hoping St. Louis works would be figured out by now, but it's been delayed and delayed. Uh, and I, as I've told pretty much, I think everybody on, on the board here, that even once I put that money out for contract, it's three to four months before I get it turned around. So, so we're looking at $400,000 worth of work until we're out of contracts anyway. So I honestly think we're not going to be pouring sidewalks again until March or April. Okay. So, so people, when they call and complain, just basically, you know, because what's going to be interesting with next year's budget is like, I'll be the alderman of the 23rd ward, which will probably be within the who knows what ward of the 14. Mm -hmm. And so is, you know, it's going to be interesting to see whether my part of the 23rd ward, which is actually in another ward, that's part of another ward, how that money is going to come out, you know, uh, you know, so I guess I'm, I'm really concerned that next year, I, it's going to be interesting to see if, you know, I mean, these are money's going to be going to non-existing wards. Uh, the wards will exist, it just won't have any aldermen in them. Yep. You know, so if we don't get our side work done, I assume that that's going to create a bigger mess for next year. So nothing will get done even next year. So potentially it could be looking at two years. So anyway, it's just a concern, you know, and, and you know, I, I know it, it it's, it can't just be me that's getting calls saying, you know, you told me we're going to get our sidewalks and uh, we're not. And, and again, I, I, I'm very concerned about next year. Uh, Alderwoman Evans, yes. Uh, yes, I had someone to go out and look and the bulk pickup uh, mattresses uh, in the alley between Ashland and Elm Bank between Cora and uh, Taylor. So that's the 45 through 4600 block of Elm Bank and Ashland. Uh, the mattresses and the dump trash has not been picked up. So whoever said the bulk stuff was picked up, it hasn't. So all the woman, we did a cleanup in the 4,400 blocks of Ashland, Elm Bank, Greer, and Labity. So we didn't do the 45 or 4,600 blocks, which is what where you say the mattresses are. And we need the 45 <laughs> 46 <laughs> yes. on, on those addresses because that's where the trash is, okay? okay. Thank you, Ms. I, I will get it in for you. Thank and you. Thank you. That that was Ashland, Elm Bank, Cora, Sarah. I'm sorry, say that again. Ashland, Elm Bank, Cora, Sarah. So it's okay. the 45, Ashland, 4600 blocks of Ashland and Elm Bank. Right. And hit Ashland, Greer, Elm Bank, and Labity while mm -hmm. you're at it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the 4500 through 4600 on all of those streets, mm -hmm. alleys. Okay. Thank you, Ken. So anybody else, any hands? I don't see any hands. Oh, yes, I do. Let's see, wait a minute. I see oh. uh, Alderman Bosley, 
You have a hand up. I'm sorry. This is going to be real quick. I, I just okay. want to ask, just for the record. <laughs> um, Director Jankowski, or Commissioner Jankowski, is Alan still there? Yes, Alan's here. Um, as far as the, the amount of workers that you have this year versus the amount of workers that you had previously before COVID, um, can you give us an idea of exactly how many work workers you're working with um, this fiscal year? We have we have about thirty full time or part time staff working with us, and then we typically have a uh, right up around eighty. Got you. So so working it seems to be under about sixty percent capacity of what you would normally have out here in the communities, um, cutting grass and dealing with the vegetation. Correct. Correct. Um, what about your tree trimming, tree cutting crews? The trimmers are, well, yeah, trimmers and cutters, are those, are those two different crews? Yes, yes, they are separate. So our, uh, our uh, tree trimmers, we have 29 on our TO, and right now uh, we're down uh, 13, and that kind of varies from day to day. We hire a few people, we lose a few people. Got you. So we got 13 so, people trimming trees. How many people do we have cutting? Cutting, cutting grass. No, no, yeah, cutting, the, cutting, cutting the trees or the tree trimmers and cutters. Do we just add those yeah. in together? The tree trimmers, they they prune the trees and then they uh, remove the trees, both. So gotcha. that's that's the twenty nine folks that we have, and we're approaching like down fifty percent on them. Understood. Are, are they going down because of seasonal reasons or? No, no, no. That's just those are full time employees. We just. We just can't hire and, and keep them on. Jeez. Um, do, do you know the reason why they're leaving like that? Shot of 29, we've got 13. What What is the capacity? Uh, what, what, what are we maxed out in people at as far as the tree cutters are concerned? Like, is there room for 50? How many actual uh, slots do you have open? 29 is our TO. 29 is where oh. we're, we're trying to fill up to. Okay, got you. And once again, it's my apologies. So. Let me make sure we only got 13 out of 29, right? We we're down 13. So we're what are we? What is that? Um 16. 16. 16. Okay, gotcha. You can. Okay. So yeah, when, once again, th those are good for residents to know. I like to tell them statistically where we are and why they're looking at half the amount of services that they're getting. And um, you know, specifically why it is the grass is taking much longer to get cut than what they're normally used to. Um, you know, even though they feel like they, you know, hell, we all want to get four or five cuts a year, but, um, you know, you dramatically see the difference in what you're getting now versus what you were getting. And, you know, it's good for residents to, to have that information and, you know, know that we are truly short in what those numbers are from a general standpoint. So I do appreciate the work that you have been doing with the, the few workers that you do have. I think you all are very responsive. It is kind of very difficult to get out there and handle um, all of uh, the vegetation with once again, half the crews and the debris team. Is there any debris team at all that you have that can pick up the trash prior to those people cutting grass? Is it practice in South City or uh, the Central West End or other places to rake the grass first before they cut the grass, therefore a bag of chip that is intact doesn't end up a hundred pieces. Yeah, we do. We just, the same crew that's cutting the grass, they go out and comb that property and pick up the bulk so that we're not uh, shredding it all and then having to go back and pick up a hundred small pieces. But uh, is it, it gets Most difficult. It gets difficult as the grass gets to be six to seven feet tall to find all that litter in there okay understood is there any equipment needs that you all have also let's say for instance if we work working at capacity therefore you know as we do move forward with our conversation at least we'll be aware of the you know the technical uh, equipment issues that you do struggle with also yeah alderman i think the biggest thing for weed control is that uh brush cutter that forestry head uh piece of equipment that we're trying to get with the uh with the bobcat and then have a forestry head on there so we can really try to tackle some of that brush uh and like a lot of you mentioned you know in the back of the yard you know the grass needs to be cut and a lot of times it's not grass it's brush at this point 
and it's and it's cumbersome. It's not like you can just go back there with a weed eater. It's not like you can go back there with uh, even a lawnmower. No, you have to go back there with a uh, um, chainsaws and and 10, 15 people just to clear the lot within a couple hours. So it uh, and then then we pile all that brush up in the alley, and then Kent has to come pick that up. So um, so I think if we got a piece of that piece of equipment, it will help. It won't be the cure all end all, but maybe we can see how it works and. Uh, we need to start thinking how can we uh, advance our technology and our and, uh, and the way we we do our processes out there. Okay, how many brush cutters do you need? One, two. How how many would suffice for you to be? Yeah, we'll work? we'll start with any. So um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I just want you know we're just trying to get one going and and see how it works and see how it it, it pans out for us and then maybe we can build on top of there. It's not a it's it's about 120. You're looking at a, you know, if you need a, a truck to haul it and a trailer, about $150,000 piece of equipment. So it's not not looking at, you know, something that's fifteen twenty thousand dollars $20,000. It's a uh, pretty substantial amount of money. Understood. Uh, well, let's definitely appreciate the, uh, the information and uh, appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. Thank you. And I just want clarification. One last question there uh, for Kent. Um, when you say that you have a one or two man crew for patching these holes, because I also have gotten uh, residents that are getting on my neck. I just had one text me during this meeting uh, about a pothole that they hit and um, they called the city about it to see if they fixed the damages. And from their understanding that the city won't fix it if it wasn't caught in the DSB prior to them calling if there was already one call for it to be done and it's been a few days then the city could be liable. If they're the first call, um, then they were told that they, you know, basically called it in and, and the city will not be held liable for that, um, that uh, the problem that it caused their vehicle. Um, so when you say you're working with a one or two man crew specifically, are you saying one or two people or one or two crews? Therefore, we can be very clear. It'd be one or two people that some days we actually have one guy, one person working north to patch all the major potholes and Kings Highway, Grand Natural Bridge, et cetera. And some days we have that once or another one person doing the same thing south. If we don't have anything on major streets, uh, those two will actually team up and actually try to knock out 15 or 20 potholes in a given area. So it's just two people two people period and they can only do at capacity per day of course different potholes vary but what would you say is a you know kind of general idea of what it is that they have the capacity to do per day yeah it, it really depends uh if they're doing like i said they're they're doing majors and we've got uh property damage complaints or whatever uh you know you may have one on north king's highway west natural bridge and you know they may be going a couple miles in between uh so they may only get five or 10 today. If they can actually, when we actually have people and we can actually put these guys in, let's just say a neighborhood essentially in your ward uh, that we have 15 or 20, or let, let's just say ward three, uh, they definitely have the possibility if we have enough people uh, with a two or three person crew to go in and knock out 50 potholes in a day, five, zero, not 15, 50 potholes in a day. Uh, but if they're running around kind of chasing their tail, then they're not very efficient. Got you. And how many people are you short exactly? Today I have 99 employees full-time out of 157 full-time employees in street maintenance. Out of 157, you've got 99 period. That, that's, that's correct. And it's every, every week it's going down all or every pay period it's going down because uh, the outside world is paying a lot of money to, to get people. Uh, waste management is one of those. Uh, you know, they're, they're hiring guys for something, I, I mean, $70,000, $60,000, dollars a year if they got any experience. And these guys are making thirty thirty two here in the city. I don't ever expect to keep up with that, but hopefully they'll get those jobs filled up at waste management and then people will come for a, a decent paying job, not a great paying job. 
Good. So once again, I appreciate that. How many people are you missing specifically out of the the um the pothole filling crews? I know we got just two people, but what do you need? Ten or twelve more? Well, let, let me describe it a little differently. Uh, our two like beginning tiers of people here are what we call utility workers and lead utility workers. Uh, most people that come straight in uh, to get a job here, they start off a utility worker, which means you're uh, typically on a patch truck, but in the summertime, you'd be on a, on a pavement crew or wintertime, you might be uh, on a stow crew. But between just utility worker and lead utility worker, it's, uh, I believe, 33 or 34 people short, and that is the labor behind our department. And without that, it's, it makes everything very hard. And that also transfers over to uh, many of the other departments also, because we get these utility workers. First thing we do is we get that utility worker their CDL. Once we get them that CDL, they can either stay in our department as what they're doing, they may decide to promote to a street sweeper driver and they may decide to promote to a refuge driver. They made it go wherever else in the city. But once they get that CDL, you know, they have options at that point. Uh, historically, most of them have stayed with street maintenance and the street department. But, uh, you know, we have several ex-employees, I'm even saying ex-employees. We've had many employees that have promoted from here to go drive a garbage truck because it was a five, six dollar an hour raise, which I can't blame a guy for that. I, I actually appreciate that and it helps the city out. So, so yeah, it's 33, 34 of those bottom two tiers, which is, that is our workforce. You know, that, that's, that those are the guys out shoveling, raking, actually doing the work, running the jackhammer versus uh, the guys in the street sweeper which of course they are very important too, but you got to have that labor side. Okay. Well, th those are my questions. I appreciate the answers. Once again, it's, it's important for the general public to know when we say we're short, because a lot of departments are saying that to put those numbers out there. So we'll get, get a realistic idea of how short we are and what those crews would normally look like under different circumstances. So they're not mentally thinking where well, you only short one or two people, you know, you just got to make it work. We're short half a crew. 75% of crew, 33 people, um, you know, out of what, 35 on the, the individuals who are filling potholes. That's a, that's a large, very, very large number, you know, when you talk in terms of capacity. So, um, you know, I, I appreciate the hard work and you doing what you, what you can with what you got. Thank you. So um, I see Alderman Evans, but I also, Alderman Howard had her hand up first and then Alderman Evans. And then we're gonna try and keep the chart. Most of everybody's left the meeting. We're down to 18 people, but uh, all the women, Howard, is your hand just up from? All the men, Howard, okay. I don't see her, maybe. So all the men, Evans. Yes, I'll make this brief. I just have one concern and it's a dead, rotten, that's a tree that has died. I've had it uh, to be cut down uh, several years. It's in the 45, uh, no, 46, I believe, 16 Elm Bank. It's dead. Some of the limbs have fallen on people's cars, and I would really like to have that tree be cut down. That's it. 46, 16 Elm Bank? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank we'll you. It. And Alderman Howard, I don't, I don't see your hand still up, but maybe it's just up. Uh, seeing and hearing from no one else, uh, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Oh, good. I thought we were going to be here for a while. Second. Here. <laughs> so all in favor, just aye. Right, can aye. we do? Can we, aye. So aye. I think, so the meeting's adjourned. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you all next Tuesday, I hope.